try not to move the rug. Yeah. <laughs> that thing is super easy to move. Uh, all right. So this one's going to be a little bit different. You'll notice we're up front here. A little bit more podcast-esque, if you will. So I've got Seth with me because he is uh, a, a, a the, one of the people that I need in this, let's call it an episode. So what this is, is going to be talking about how we find deals on these bikes. Now you're a wheeling and dealing fool. So I obviously uh, you guys have seen all of the stuff I have. I have a lot of projects in here. Some of it is to blame on him. So guilty. Um, between us, we've had shoot. If we had to put a number, how many how many bikes do you think you've had in a lifetime? Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, I don't know. It's got to be at least a hundred, if not more. Holy crap. In that range, I really do think. I didn't think there. it was gonna be that high. So every time, I mean, I know this guy. Every time we talk, I'm still surprised how much stuff you have. So, yeah, between the two of us, we're probably looking at a couple hundred bikes, you know, that we've cycled through. And a common question that I get asked on a lot of my videos is, how do you find these deals? So I feel like this would be a kind of a cool episode to maybe try something new on. We'll sit down. Again, kind of like a podcast style, and let's talk about how we find these good deals. So, beyond Seth, I'm going to have probably three or four more people that I know also hustle and wheel and deal. So, you met Eric at Motorcycle Rewind. Mm -hmm. We're going to hear from him. Um, we're going to hear from Mike from Ace Cafe Bikes and uh, a, couple, a couple more people. So, it should be a fun episode, and it should be uh, maybe informative. So, I have three questions. All right. They're pretty basic. So what is the best deal you have done? Meaning like, what's the best deal you feel like you've got? It doesn't have to necessarily be like a monetary thing. Maybe one that's special to you. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. That's why I didn't want to tell you what we were doing. Okay. And then the second question is, how did you make that deal happen? And then the third question is going to be, what advice would you have for maybe other people trying to hunt down those deals? You know, how, how do you make this happen? Okay. Honestly, I've been pretty blessed in the regard that I've come across some really good deals in my time of messing with bikes and vehicles in general. Mm -hmm. That's um, why you're sitting here, because I, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, there's just so many. Uh, honestly, one of the best ones I've done recently is a 1969 Honda Trail. Mm -hmm. um, Trail 90. And that thing has brand new tires, it's got a brand new battery, wiring harness, the dude puts some money into it and it runs, rides, and stops, which particularly the stopping part I'm not used to at all, <laughs> let alone the running part. Is that the one you brought by the other day? No, I don't think you've seen this one I yet. think that the one you brought by was green, it was like a newer one, right? It was a blue Honda Express. Okay. Yeah, a little scooter. And so this one is a what again? This one is a Honda Trail. Okay, so it's a 69? 69. 69. Okay. So, like, original gen, like, first gen kind of thing going on. Okay. And for those who don't know, those are really popular right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hard to find. Um, and what I traded for it was this, <laughs> this is a funny story of itself, a Chinese quad that I drug out of a dumpster. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Literally, my coworkers and I, we, there's this dumpster uh, where we're working at, and this Dude had dropped a brand new Honda Quad, and or no, Chinese Quad, not Honda, yeah. by any means. Yeah. <laughs> um, just dumped it in there. And so we yanked it out of there, and it was like a 2021 model four-wheeler. Yeah, this was pretty recent, too. I mean, yeah, within the last two months, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Right around there. And, of course, I'm not going to leave it sitting in a dumpster. I would, it's, it's, no, of course not. It's a motorized vehicle. It's got to come home with me one way or another. Yeah, if it didn't have a motor, you'd still drag it out. I probably would, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I could do something with it. Yeah. Um, so I got it home, got to messing around with it, and uh, as I do, I accumulate more projects. I got kind of pushed to the back. and it, I think the overarching issue is it didn't have spark. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of let it sit. And eventually this guy had an ad for a uh, Trail 90 on Facebook. And I was like, 
all right, well, I wonder if he still has it, because I was just going to buy it, because I was wanting one, because my buddy has a 69 as well that's red, and mm -hmm. we've been working on getting it running, and it'd be pretty cool to have some twin Honda trails to go and that run would. on. Yeah. Um, so I messaged him, he said, no, unfortunately that one's sold, but uh, I do have this other one that I've been working on that I'm not ever going to get to that I'd be interested in trading for that quad that I saw you have listed on Facebook. Because he made the connection that I was a guy that had these quads for sale. Okay. Well, that's what I, I mean. What I do on Marketplace specifically, if there's somebody selling something that I'm gonna reach out to, or if somebody messages me to buy something, I always view their profile, and a lot of times, yeah, they'll have stuff listed as well. So mm -hmm. I kind of I cross shop, so to speak. Yeah. So I did exactly what he did, I guess. You can come across some really good deals that may not have even been obvious to you to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's exactly what happened here. And I was like, I mean, who's going to pass up trading a Chinese quad for a Honda Trail? I mean, it's, it's, was it a straight up trade? Yeah, no, no money involved. We met around halfway, and he's like, here, I'll even start it for you. He started it for me on the trailer. It runs, it rides, and just did a swap, and we were both happy as can be. So That's something I haven't done. I don't know if I've done any trading. Really you know, I know that's trade. I know it's very popular. I don't know if I've ever just done a straight up trade for something. Really? I've gone with friends who've like traded cars. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of my friends just like continuously just trading cars. Who knows who last had a title to that vehicle? But I mean, that was just what they did. Yeah. So, so yeah, you got a free uh, Chinese ATV out of a dumpster, and then. Through working deals, shopping, you ended up trading it for a Trail 90, the Trail 90 that runs. Mm -hmm. So, how much money did you have into that for it? Because I know you, you bought a few wiring things for it, right? Yeah, I was like, as I had time, I'd throw a couple of things at it and just kind of doing some very light diagnosis. Never really committed to it because I had other things going on I wanted to do. Yeah. I think I was like $30 into it in total. <laughs> like, and then like fuel. Yeah. Yeah, literally. So... 50 bucks max in this thing. Okay. So I don't even think, I, I haven't seen this trail yet, but that's that's a cool bike. And like I said, those are really popular right now. The Like just the trails, mini trails. Um, like I used to have a Z50. That was my first bike. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Honda monkeys and stuff. And then you've recently come across like a whole rash of like Honda Expresses and everything like that. Still trying to get rid of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he brought this this green one I mentioned. He brought it here the other day, and he's like, "You want to ride it? You want to ride?" I know exactly what he's doing. He's trying to. You're trying to get me to buy this thing. Well, oh, naturally, you're not going to turn down riding a Honda <laughs> Express or any I had this vehicle. very rare. I was very strong in this moment. I said no. You know, still working on it. Yeah. I'm going to convince you one of these days. Uh, yeah, you're lucky. It was like 12 degrees outside that day. That's the only reason that it didn't leave my truck that day. Mm-hmm. He forgot about it back there. It was covered in snow, so I did it too. It's still in my truck bed, actually. Too, so. Yeah, but you got the trail. Yeah. So, yeah, you've had over 100 bikes. Obviously, you've seen some deals come through here. So, um, let's see. That was what was the best deal you've got, how you made that deal happen. What advice would you have for other people who are looking to find these kind of deals? I think just persistency is a big part of it. Like, you got to be really keeping up on Facebook and seeing what pops up at the right time because those once-in-a-lifetime deals are gone within five or ten minutes. Yeah, those once-in-a-lifetime deals that happen every other day? Yeah. Yeah. I send him a ton of stuff. You send me a ton of stuff. So we are a horrible influence on each other. Incredibly. Which is part of the reason why we have all this stuff. And this is actually how we met is uh, I my mini bike over here, I... I wanted an old school Briggs and Stratton engine. I wanted a, a flathead five horse Briggs with patina on it. That's very specific, okay? So I'm on Facebook Marketplace and I'm always just kind of searching for Briggs flathead. And sure enough, I find, uh, I find somebody, you know, a little bit far away from where I was currently living, had a whole rash of them, you know? So I, I messed with him and it was Seth. And so you had ended up buying uh, the remnants of a lawnmower shop, right? Yes. So you yes. bought like it was like thirty or something, old a variety of different engines. You know, there was that was actually when I first my I obtained my first motorcycle too. At you were, that same auction. You were like sixteen or something. I I was fifteen. That yeah, year. it was fifteen yeah. at this time. 
So I walk, like I go to buy this engine. I walk in uh, to like the barn. You've got the old CB350 sitting there. I'm like, we're gonna be friends, you know. And that was that was pretty cool how that happened. I've met a lot of my friends through Craigslist and Marketplace. <laughs> no shame, but yeah. I don't know. you know, we, you're, we constantly are like on Facebook Marketplace, just like constantly. And you know, a a comment I get a lot when I whenever I post about a deal is like, oh, those deals don't exist where I'm at. Like, bullshit, they do. You just gotta beat people like me from getting to them. You know, we're Seth because we watch that stuff like a hawk. And uh, the moment it pops up, it's like, I've got gas in the van, there's ramps in it, and I can quickly go get some cash, you know, to, to jump on those deals. So you just got to act quick. They, they do pop up, you know. Well, and I think a big part of it is, like, there's the deals on Facebook you come across, too. But there's also the instances where you come across people not even attending to buy anything as yeah. well. Um, like I always try to keep a little cash on hand because you never know when something's going right. to come up. Oh, the same thing, yeah. Like I mean, you keep you keep like keep five hundred bucks in cash somewhere, and like that's most of the time plenty, more mm -hmm. than enough to, to obtain about anything in this building. You Honestly, know, yeah. You know, um, that I mean, so like kind of the same topic. My best deal is actually my CB seven fifty sitting here, Patty. That barn find one. That bike was two miles away from my house, and it was not even listed for sale. So I had seen a sales ad, and it was a guy advertising scrap hauling, like that he will haul scrap away for you. And so in his lead photo, it's like, here's a trailer with some stuff, and I can see in the background, there's this CB750 in this barn. And I'm like, brother, okay. Sent him a message, and I was like, hey, do you have that bike? He's like, yeah. I'm like, would you sell it? He's like, yeah. Sure enough, I, he was like two miles away. I drove up there, engine was locked up. You know, it, it was pretty sad. There was no title at the time. And uh, okay, I, I negotiated down to a hundred bucks, you know. Uh, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't know I got, oh, I yeah, I got that for a hundred bucks. bucks. Wow, okay. Yeah, so I, I got the bike for a hundred bucks. It needed a lot of work, you know. Um, worked that deal, and then it was like six months later or something. I stayed in contact with him. He found the title because I started to go through that process of obtaining like an abandoned title or something. And so I had done a, a title search, and it was like one of his family members and stuff. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize somebody in your family had this and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he ended up finding it giving it to me at no additional cost super generous of it. it was it was awesome but that was that was my most um memorable deal my best deal i've got bikes maybe cheaper i've got free motorcycles and stuff like that but that one i came about because i was really paying attention to photos all the details of stuff you know i've messaged a lot of people the background of their photos are selling some gym equipment and there's a z50 behind it i've sent messages you know I'm that guy. So yeah, you've had over a hundred motorcycles. I really think it's in that neighborhood. Maybe not a hundred motorcycles, but total Scooters. vehicles combined, like yeah. cars, trucks, all even, of it. Even still. Yeah, I think it's at least a hundred. Okay. I'm 36. How old are you? Mm -hmm. 22. 22. So in that short of time, you've done some wheeling and dealing. You could say that, I guess. Yeah. No. It's more of an addiction than a hobby at this point. I gotta be honest, but at some point somebody will uh, give us an intervention here because I think we both kind of need it. it needs you know, to happen honestly. It's kind of it's kind of fun though. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, but that's our stories on. Uh, oh wait, I guess I gotta answer that last one. So yeah, the advice for others looking for deals. The same kind of thing. Keep an eye on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. I'm torn on because it's kind of dead. But at the same time, that can also work to your advantage because the people that don't know Craigslist is dead might post something up. Yeah, that's when you get those. And there's no, you get no attention. So another thing is like, if you're gonna try to find a CB750, you don't want to just search CB750. Type in old motorcycle because sometimes people won't know what it is. They won't care. They just want to move it along. You know that. That's what happens, so. 
networking, of course, but if you guys are going at this alone and you're just going with sales channels, you know, Facebook Marketplace for at least me has has been the winner, oh, for sure. You know, it's it's the most constant turnover, like there's always something on there, but you gotta act fast. So keep some cash on hand, keep some fuel fuel in the van. That's not it's a rhyme. Put that on a t-shirt. Yeah, you should do that. Cash on hand and gas in the van. So, yeah. But now we're gonna turn. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna flip the script. We're gonna go to a few other people, and uh, we'll see what they have to say. I'm, I'm sure they're gonna have some cool stories too. All right, I'm gonna try this again. That was my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what we're doing. So this is just. I'm like... always winging it. This is like a normal video. We're just we're yeah. just winging it. So. Awesome. All right, everybody, this is Mike, and uh, Mike, you have a channel called Ace Cafe Bikes. You're up in the north, and I wanted you to be in this one, not only because you're my friend, but because you seem to focus a lot on flipping motorcycles. You're always hunting down different deals and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I thought it would be fun to bring you on here among among the select few that I've picked because, uh, I don't know, this is a comment that I get a lot is just like, how do you find these deals on bikes? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, kind of give me a give me a rundown. Give the people an intro to who you are and kind of what you do, what you're about. Thank you, BJ, for including me. Um, yeah, so as BJ said, I'm Mike with Ace Cafe Bikes, and we started this uh, this channel about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it seems like geez, four years ago. Um, Lies. Yeah, uh, for something that my son and I can do kind of uh, pick apart motorcycles, kind of get us involved doing something mechanical and be, get out of the house, you know, do something fun like that. And it's kind of, it was his idea to start a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. like a lot of kids. And so it's kind of grown from there and we've had some pretty decent growth We're nothing like a hundred K man. We're, oh. we're here, but uh, can't complain where we're at and we're, we're, we're loving what we're doing. Yeah, so, yeah, it's fun. You and Chase are, are doing some cool stuff, and I'm I'm definitely excited for your uh, your 450 build or 400 build. Is 400, it 50 yeah. or 400, 400. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be awesome. So. Yeah, but that's you know on on that bike though. That was one of the ones that you know you're always you're wheeling and dealing. You're finding mm -hmm. finding deals. So uh, you know the subject of the video, but I have three questions to ask you, and uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's see. Am I frozen? All right. We're recording again. Okay. Okay. We're, we're starting again now, everybody. Like my internet just completely dropped off. Thanks, Spectrum. Ugh. Anyway, so we were just talking about Chase's bike, and I was just getting ready to ask you three questions that I have that I okay. have been asking of everybody. So the first question is, what is the best deal that you feel you have got on a bike? And I've always framed this one with, uh, it doesn't have to be like a monetary number. It can just, whatever stands out to you, the best deal that you've got on a bike. The second question is how did you, how did that deal come about? How did you work the deal? How did you make it happen? And then the third question is advice or what advice would you give to other people who are out there searching for bikes and, you know, they want to find a good deal. So the mic right. is yours, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I've made quite a few deals mm -hmm. in the last few years, but I think the one that stands out the most is probably the first trade I ever did, which was so foreign to me because I like to trade for dollars, not mm -hmm. for more things. And this guy was adamant that he wanted my bike, but I didn't care to have anything but cash, right? So I was trying to sell the CB 900, you know, that was going to be a build that we were going to do. And then we decided against it because like you're experiencing now, BJ, you're collecting a lot, right? And it just seems like, oh, I've got so much inventory. And it was coming to the end of the season, trying to push out. And um, so nonetheless, he he didn't have the cash, but he said, I've got this uh, Virago. And I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh, that sounds great. And then it was 1100 and I had a 750 in the past. I'm like, I always wanted to have an 1100. So we traded two bikes for his Virago and his Virago was really good condition. So I drove the CB 900 was ride ready. And I also traded him another bike that I didn't really want. And okay. he thought he could fix it up. 
And um, so I took all that stuff over to him and he gave me the Virago and we rode that around for the next season and then we sold that. So um, I think that's probably the best like story because it's difficult when you start thinking, like you said, with monetary values, like how much money did I have in the CB 900 and how much, I don't even remember the other bike that I sold him. I think it was, I don't even remember what it was. I think it was uh, the Yamaha XV uh, 750 triple that oh, I only paid $100. Triple. Yeah. And um, anyway, you know, it's difficult how much money I had in that, how much money would have it cost us to buy his bike and how much money did I sell the Raga for kind of all wrapped that up in too big package and was it worth it? And I, I think having the experience of being able to drive that bike, we did a review on that. And that still to, to this day is probably the best yielding video we've ever had if, if you take away the shorts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. The Virago is really cool looking. Um, and so for the, the people who are unfamiliar, like the, the CB 900, that was a, a, like a 1983, something like that. It was a 1980. 1980. Okay. And it was um, weird with the 10, 10 speed I mean, it had a high. Oh yeah. The, yeah. The 900 C's. So yeah. yeah, those are pretty, I've yet to ride one, but uh, I, that'll, ha that'll happen someday. Cause I, re I really want to experience that transmission. So so that, yeah. and then um, you think it was uh, the, an XS 750 that you traded for, or with, along with. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so what you, you actually modified that Virago that you traded for though, right? Like you turned that into a bobber? That was years ago. That was the 750 that I had was the bobber. I actually traded the, uh, the Virago. I sold the Virago to a guy that was really fresh to ride motorcycles and the Virago had a very low seat, even on that 1100, I think the seat was at like 27 inches. So it's, yeah, they had a big drop frame in them and stuff. Yeah. And so it fit him really well because he he was a short guy. He, I think he's even shorter than you, BJ. I mean, he's, he's a really little guy. I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> An interesting fact, you know, since we peruse the Facebook a lot, that bike is up for sale again. I contemplated buying it. Back that's, always, that's always funny seeing your old stuff pop up I, it yeah. happens to me too yeah um so then so then this deal like what was what was special about it was it um just kind of getting that experience like trading wise and just i think so okay because like the trading aspect is kind of new new to me i've only recently like with those two uh cb 450s that i traded plus cash for another cb 450 but an older one other than that, I really, it's always been like, I'll trade for cash, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a new one for you too, huh? That was the first time. And since then I've, I've done it twice more. So it's, it's just different. It's, it's kind of fun. You know, it's in the other two times I've done it, it was to kind of unload some projects I didn't want anymore. And then I inherited projects that someone else didn't want. Mm -hmm. So like the recent <laughs> ones was three CBR 600s for, um, uh, a gold wing and an XV 250. Okay. So, yeah. Neither one of those. I really think I, I really want to have a gold wing, but I really think I want one that just ride. It's ready to ride. Yeah. Well, you have that concourse. That's like that. That's a good sport touring bike, but uh, yeah. has it blown you away or is it still just kind of not, not, not everything for you? No, it, that was a great bike. It was a lot of fun having that one. We brought it down to your place and it kept up with you guys, kind of. I mean, I think the rider has a lot to do with keeping up, but that, that it's a fun bike. Yeah. Yeah, you've had a lot of stuff. So um, before I forget, I just want to make sure we covered. So so you, you took two bikes and you traded for another one. Um, and that was because that guy was looking to to do a trade, not necessarily yeah. buy something cash. So. Yep. Okay. He was looking to buy the CB 900 and he didn't want to, he didn't have enough cash for it. And then he said, I have this bike. And then that, in my opinion, was worth more than the CB 900. So I didn't want to have to, I wasn't looking to buy a bike. I was looking to sell a bike. So I yeah. threw him one that I didn't want. And then I think I got a great deal on it. But so yeah, the space is, space is worth something. So, you know, if you, if you had something you didn't want, that's, you know, you made space by, taking two and making one out of it. Absolutely. So then, you know, you've been doing, you've been flipping bikes for a long time, but uh, you have, how do I format it? You, you have been flipping to try to build 
you know, like build revenue and stuff too, as far yeah. as like you'll buy one, make a little bit of money on it, you know, sell it, make a little bit of money. And so like, what's your, what's your idea there? What's been your experience? Well, the reason why that started was first of all, we, we started flipping bikes so I can get some more mechanical knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to kind of see what bikes are. Cause a lot of bikes you can buy that people have given up on and all they really need is a, a refresh, right? Just clean yeah, the cars, exactly. and boom, magic, they're fixed. And then, so we did that quite a few bikes, buying them, fixing them. And actually sometimes we sold them within like the next weekend, you know, you buy them on a weekend, fix them during the week, sell them on the weekend. We did that a couple of times, but the ultimate goal for that whole um, plan was to get a, an enclosed trailer. And yeah, that, and that you have now. Times. Yeah. And that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Worked out really well. That's a cool goal though. A cool goal though, in the beginning, you know, you want to try to build up that mechanical experience too. Um, I think I've approached that in kind of the same way. Like I try not to have too much of the same thing twice until I discovered CB 750s and I just can't have enough, but like. Or CX 500s. I mean, or, you've got or CX 500s. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I like to try to have different, different stuff and just, you know, get some experience with that. At least that's what I do with, with cars and, and other vehicles, at least experiencing that. But yeah, um, that's pretty cool. So what's, um, you got the trailer and you have, mm -hmm. uh, you have a couple bikes and you got that project with Chase. Are you still looking to, to do some more flipping this season or are you going to kind of put that yeah. to the side? Yeah. This season that we just came out of in 2023 was, all about finishing the garage. We had another graduate. Yeah, that so was a big project. Finished the inside and we finished where I'm at right now. I'm in the upstairs of that right now. And um, so that was, that was fun. And get that to check that off the list. 2024 should be a lot more about buying bikes, buying bikes and, and doing that. Yeah. You're going to let Chase negotiate for you? I think I should. He's a, he's top negotiator. Okay. That'd be cool. We'll, we'll need a video of that for sure. Yeah. No, he he would suck at it. He he would just be like, yeah, okay, sure, seven thousand bucks, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> um. So how do so how do you find deals? How do you uh? What's your what's your sources? Uh, probably solely Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, every once in a while, you get tired of looking at the old the same old stuff on Facebook, so you switch over to Craig's list. But Craig's list just doesn't have anything anymore, and I don't. I don't know why, because it seems like if you have to pay to post it, you think there'd be more better stuff there to see, but it, there just isn't. It's just well, even at three bucks, you know, it, it, I, I think it's about three bucks now to list yeah. something. And, and the whole idea with that, I think was to fil filter out all the scams because mm -hmm. Craigslist became overran by like scam posts and stuff like that. It was bad. Yeah. And, and I think that's ultimately what killed it. And, uh, you know, everything went to Facebook, but, you know, I mentioned in, like another person I was talking with just occasionally you have to check on Craigslist because there's people that are kind of out of the loop that mm -hmm. are still posting on there and you can find deals that are just not being seen in general. Yeah. I, I think I'm pretty decent at, um, at being cordial with people too. Like, uh, if it's a bike, you know, we're, I'm, I look at that probably at least um, once a week, sometimes you know, every day, you know, depends on the when, where you are, what season it is. At Craigslist or, mar or Marketplace? Marketplace. Yeah. And so you'll see some pictures that maybe you're not so excited about that bike. But I mean, I, I've commented several times to people, if you would just take the time to pull it away from the corner, wash it, you could probably double your, your asking price. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you don't care about it anymore doesn't mean you, that you should just give it away, right? Maybe that's as a buyer, that shouldn't be something that I should say, but it's just annoying that people could care less about some of the things that they're trying to sell. And I think that's it where a weird we, one. we as buyers, we we do uh cash in on that, right? So yeah. And you know, to be fair, like same thing, you're trying to help the person out i'll i'll find listings all the time that are listed incorrectly like it's the wrong bike or wrong model or wrong information mm -hmm. about it and i'll be like hey just to help you out like it's actually this model because you know they're getting hit with a bunch of questions and stuff that they can't answer so yeah yeah i try to i try to help people out too um and especially like sometimes i'll go look at something 
I don't end up buying it. The deal falls through. It's not quite what I was expecting. And, and it's always, not, you know, we're always nice with each other. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, like I'll generally try to help them out a little bit more like, Hey, like, you know, the bike, it needs this. Here's about what that would cost. And, and I'll give them part numbers and everything. You know, I always try to be helpful when possible. I think yeah. it's important. You know, the other thing that with Facebook that I like to look at is the guy who had the wrong picture, right? So instead of the, his opening picture is a picture of the bike, maybe it's a picture of the lawn or something stupid, you know, so you click on that and then, and, oh, look, there's 18 pictures of this really cool looking bike mm -hmm. that no one's seeing because your first picture exactly. is stupid. So it, it you, you make a lot of, I think that's just comes with looking at it all the time, right? You see exactly. the same stuff. Oh, that's different. What's that one? And then it's like, oh, look at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, I mean, going like my CB750, that I only got that because it was in the background of a photo and it wasn't listed for sale. Mm. You know, it was a guy who was hauling scrap. I've already, this would be the second time I tell the story in this video, but yeah, like that guy, he wasn't selling that bike. It was in the background in the corner. And I'm like, eagle eyed, like, Hey, you know, what's that? And so yeah, photos are every bit as important as like the title and description. You know, yeah. I search old motorcycle a lot just because mm -hmm. people don't know what they have. So I'm going to flip the script on you a little bit. How do you do start the negotiation? So if, let's say if a guy's looking at selling his bike for a thousand bucks, what's your opening offer In, without knowing anything about the bike? What would you start with? I guess I, I would have to, I would have to see the photos. Um, I generally don't negotiate on Facebook. At least that's my thing. I know everybody tries to in reverse, but Mm -hmm. I won't, if, if it's something that I know is already at a good price, I just ask when I can go look at it. Mm -hmm. I ask when it's available. I might ask a few details like, Hey, do you have a picture of like this particular thing? Or do you like, is the title signed correctly? Um, I'll ask a few questions, but for the most part, by the time I message them, I've already decided that it's worth me going to look at. So once I'm in person, though, I will I will then negotiate after I built that little a little rapport with them. Like, I'm not here to waste time. I'm here to be fair. You know, mm -hmm. of course, I want the best deal I can get. But I'm still I'm still more old school. I try to just negotiate in person. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a thousand dollars, if he's got it listed as at a thousand. I would think I can get a couple hundred bucks off of it, maybe more, you know. Yeah, maybe more. So. I've told the story on a video once before, but my brother taught me the art of negotiation because he's, he's this big, tough looking guy and I'm not. And so I'm always want to be nice, you know? So I would always just opening, I'd start at 10%. So in my thousand dollar story here, I'd go 900. And if he would agree to that, then great. And then you almost always have that split. So you're at 950. My brother, he's, he's more of a 50% guy. Yeah. You go 500 bucks right away. And because he doesn't need it, right? If the guy says no, I'm like, fine, I don't need it. I'll go find yeah. something else. So I'm not quite to that level of douchebaggery, but I'm getting a little bit better and more aggressive at my pricing. And what I've done recently, like when it comes into like the winter seasons, if it's for sale for like 18 weeks, 25 weeks, I might say, I know that you say you don't respond to people saying if this is still available, but hey, after 25 weeks, why is it still on here? And then I'll say something like, if you, if you're literally are just trying to get rid of it out of the garage, I'll do like, if it's a thousand bucks, I'll say 150 bucks and I'll take it. Yeah. Now I've actually won some deals like that, which is really weird, but. Well, yeah. no, you're being, you're being fair and you're being honest with them. I think that's, I mean, that's, you should be that. And your brother's not wrong in, in necessarily shooting it at, at 50%. Um, but yeah, if you just, if it's nice, like, it's all cut to me. It's like kind of quality based. Like if it's, you know, you want to get the best deal you can, but uh, I mean, I've shot it well under 50% before, you know, yeah. and I've worked deals well under 50%. And it was just like when the people had no idea what was going on, you know, they just, it, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I ha it kind of has to be in that moment. Um, right. Yeah. The 50% though, like, I don't know. 
I think a lot of times emotions. You don't get. You don't. You're not gonna get it if you don't ask for it. Ex- exactly right. And then and then you just shot yourself in the foot because maybe the guy would have done it for fifty percent and he didn't ask. Mm-hmm. But I think doing it being in this game for a while now, emotion is kind of taken out of the, the the picture for me. You know, used to you would you'd only be looking at Facebook to buy stuff that you actually wanted. Now you're looking at it in a little different light. Where like, what can I buy that I can clean up and resell? Yeah. Is there money there to be made? And then that's where I think you can get a little bit more aggressive because you're not wholly invested as you're buying it for you, right? Exactly. And like your story with the bandit. I'm sure you probably priced yourself up because that was something that you really wanted. And so, you, yeah. you know, you, you um, for fear of losing it, you're like, oh, no, I better not go as low as I'm thinking I should. I, I really want this. So it's it's just different tactics when it's yeah, I mean that's a, that's a really good example actually. So like my green bandit it's it's the it's my 99 bandit. I have had a bandit in the past. I loved it. I couldn't keep it. You know, it was mm-hmm. some title issues and then I had an FZ1 in the past. Loved it. Couldn't, you know, I I couldn't afford to keep it in that moment. It's I was out of money. I had to sell something. So I had went I'd looked at like I think three or four. Like tried to make deals on like three or four other bandits kept falling through you know i i went and looked at bikes and they just weren't what the people said or like they had the title sign in the wrong spot and i'm like "Mm -mm, i ain't messing with that anymore Mm -hmm. so i spent way more than i normally would on on the bandit i wanted i actually a viewer found it for me but that that was something it's like that's going to be for me so i'm going to spend a little bit more i don't Mm -hmm. have to worry about like making a profit on it i just i'm just going to do what i want on this one Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good example. And when it came time to, I got there, I went to negotiate and I was very nice. Like he knew I wanted it. I bought a plane ticket to go get the damn thing. Right. <laughs> One way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he knew I wanted it. He was very kind and uh, he knocked a few hundred bucks off for me. And that, and that was cool. You know, like, mm-hmm. I'm like, Hey man, I'm not, I, I literally said, I'm like, you know, you don't know until you ask, but we, are we, are you willing to move on the price at all? And yeah, he, we sat on a few hundred bucks, more than happy, shook hands, we're friends. Like, it's cool. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's a, that's a good example. Yeah. So what, um, what advice would you have for uh, some other people looking to make deals? Like, I know we've probably covered all of that, but uh, I don't know. What's some, some things? Um, I would say limit yourself to, like if you, I didn't have any skills when I started doing this and you don't really need to, if, if you're willing to take the risk and try to teach yourself, you know, like you got some great videos that teach people how to do everything. So limit yourself to a price point, right? Research like your, what, what I do is I start at a thousand dollars. I just search for bikes up to a thousand and try to filter through them and see if there's anything that's not completely that looks and at least in the picture, like it's just garbage. Like there's a lot more work there than it's worth. And then if you find something, then look at what good ones sell for. Yeah. So if you, if you're at under a thousand, looks like the guy's going to sell it for 700 bucks. If you clean up the carburetors and you shine it up a little bit, what are ones of that same year that are cleaned up and running? What do they sell for? And then that kind of gauges how much interest you could have in it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good advice, you know, and especially like, like you, you framed it as like, let's say as a beginner or somebody with no experience, that's, that was a perfect way of putting it, you know, setting a budget. And then you got to try to research other bikes and a sim like of that make, you know, try to research mm-hmm. price points there. And so, yeah, that's solid advice. Been working for me. Yeah. I mean, we're in a range of the bikes that I deal with are mostly in the eighties. So, you know, looking at them up at Kelly Blue Book or NADA doesn't really matter anymore it, it really now it's coming down to the old adage of every it's only worth what someone's going to pay dollar and per cc what is it dollar per cc dollar per cc that's funny because that's how we pick that's what we bought chase's bike for 400 bucks for 400 yeah that's hilarious sometimes that's a fault sometimes you fall back on it you know yeah but uh yeah no title or something like you know like the title condition is yeah. everything and then if it's if it's missing like big obvious parts, that's a big thing. And then of course, just you, you, you have to, you're always willing to learn and build new skills, but sometimes there are things that are going to be above you or not worth 
the effort, like mm-hmm. huge holes in the fuel tank from rust. Like, ugh. right. You know, a, a good replacement tank is kind of hard to find and they're pretty expensive. So get, get to, if you're going to go look at a bike, bring a flashlight, look underneath the tank. That's mm-hmm. a big one. Yeah. I guess the other thing is when you're looking at bikes at this price point, just putting new tires on, it's going to increase the value of it, not the value, the cost of it by like 20 or 30%. And you're looking at two, $250 to put new tires on it. And any bike that's set for more than five, six years is going to need new tires. Even if the tires on it supposedly were new when they were put on there, I mean, they're not new anymore. So yeah, that's something, if it's something you're buying for yourself to have to consider, and then that could be your bargaining tool. Even though the guy's going to complain, saying those are brand new tires, mm-hmm. yeah, they're not. But again, yeah, it's a bargaining tool. But you know, be, being kind, being fair. You know, yeah. I always try. So I always try to, if I pick out a flaw, I don't just go in at the flaws. I'm like, man, this thing's looking really like I really like this. I I always give them some some positives about it. You know, yeah. like, oh, I think it was fair. Like this is looking all right. Like, but it needs this into this, you know, and I personally, I know about this. It's going to take about this cost. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's okay to point out those flaws if it needs tires, but you got to be fair. Right. Yeah. I think that's the name of the game. I mean, it's just open, honest, be fair, be polite, be kind. And if it's not something that you thought when you got there, just, you don't have to spend all day there. Just go, you yeah, know, don't be afraid to walk away. Yeah. Right. Don't waste their time and they won't waste yours. Absolutely. And don't message people asking what your bottom dollar is. <laughs> Before you even all see you it. listeners, all you viewers, don't do that. Yeah. That's, that's good advice. Do do actual face-to-face negotiation. Let's yeah. make it old school again. I think that it's just it if somebody's willing to make that drive and come look at the thing that you're selling, they're they're automatically like they're willing to invest the time. So they're not, mm-hmm. they're less inclined to waste it, I should say. Right. Uh, well, awesome. I think that's a good spot to end it off. Um, I can't wait to get this episode out. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I, I'm, there's so many different perspectives that we're getting and everybody is touching on something different and it's going to be great. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. I appreciate you doing it with me. You bet. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. All right, guys. And then I will be sure to have all of his information in the description. So be sure to check there, give him a follow and uh, go watch some of his wheeling and dealings <laughs> stuff. And I look forward to that build to chase. Yeah, that's coming soon. So, all right, Mike, have a good night. You too. Thanks, BJ. All right, guys. So on the screen, you can see Thomas here. So a good friend of mine. And he is joining us because I know this guy wheels and deals like the best of them. So Tell exactly. me, in the in about a year, you have gone from having like one bike to how many do you have now? I went from in, in two years time in the first year. So we'll, we'll call it a year. Like you said, I went from two bikes, one, one and a half, two bikes to uh, nine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a slippery slope, as I say. Yeah, at one point this past summer, I had nine bikes in a small one bay garage plus a lift and building the 450. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so the the bug has bitten you hard for sure. But because of that, you've learned maybe kind of your own methods for finding deals and stuff. And I know you talk to me about some of them. Yeah. I'm sure you talk to other people trying to make sure that, uh, you know, you're buying them right. But whether it's for a build or to flip, um you've definitely bought some cool stuff so i have three questions for you that are the topic of this video the first is what do you feel is the best deal that you have gotten and it doesn't have to be like let's say a a monetary number just like in general what's the best deal you feel you've gotten number two is how you made that deal happen and then number three is what advice would you have for other people looking to make or to find deals you know for their bikes i love this All right. So like any hobby, right. And when you get really into that hobby, right. You start to learn Mm -hmm. not only how to do that hobby and how to do it with your flavor and passion associated with it, but you learn the market. If there is one, Mm -hmm. usually every hobby has a market attached to it. Oh, absolutely. Especially this, this hobby with motorcycles, cars, you know, automotive Facebook marketplace is your best friend. 
right? And as you start learning what are those bikes, right, vintage or modern, you kind of start to get a gauge of like what price range something should be versus not. And you can mm -hmm. kind of get a gauge through time of like how the market is trending and all that stuff, just like real estate. And so I've always kind of looked at all my hobbies. I'll get to the questions, but as a preface, oh, I've always looked I at like the, I like the preface. Yeah. No, it's it, to me, it's what makes it fun and interesting. But I've always viewed every single hobby as like a mini business of mine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started with like fly fishing and RC cars, all that stuff. And I've always started like a, an Instagram page and like a name, a slogan for it. It's been, it's compounded. Right. And I look at, I look at motorcycles now as my way of getting into real estate with the budget I have. Okay. And like, mm -hmm. for example, buying and flipping motorcycles, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of alignment alignments in philosophies of how to read things, how to buy, when to buy, when to sell, that go along with, you know, buying and selling real estate and developing real estate. And it's pretty neat. And I've been able to this past summer turn a thousand dollars into a profit of six thousand dollars just by oh, awesome. flipping and buying and trading and fixing. And so it's kind of fun because a lot of people always ask me, like, you know, how am I funding, you know, the two builds that I've under my belt? And a lot of it is just, you know, working a ton during the week with whatever jobs have been involved in 40 plus hours. But then in addition, a lot of that cash flow that I've been able to pour into the builds has come from buying and flipping vintage motorcycles and through the philosophies that we'll sort of talk about in those three questions you asked me. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's really cool to be able to share a and b hear others on how they do it because you have bought and sold motor motorcycles for years now and i'm sure you've come across mm -hmm. incredible deals which we have talked about and i'm sure there's some that we haven't talked about and it's mm -hmm. i'm really excited to see um you know the outcome of this episode and really sit back and watch it i think i think you're gonna like it because like yeah. the, my conversation so within this video that everybody's gonna be seeing but like my conversations with seth um, I'm obviously recording this after I talked with him, but uh, I got a kick out of his stories that I didn't know. And like, <laughs> so it, it, it's, this is going to be fun for everybody. I, this episode came about because it's a, a reoccurring question that I get is how do you find the deals on these bikes? And how do you, you know, cause I, I get a lot of comments even today. I posted a new video on the CD 750 mm -hmm. and uh, somebody commented like, Oh, those deals aren't, you know, I don't have any deals like that around me. And, I always disagree. I'm like, yes, yes, you do. You just have to beat people like me from getting there first. So again, like I also do from experience, it, the, the area that you're in really does matter yeah. to, an extent. Yeah. to an extent, but it really does matter. Like, for example, I know Eric has driven, you know, cross state to go to a motorcycle junkyard or whatever. Like not every, mm -hmm. not everything's always in your backyard. But you have a you have a quite unique scenario with that that whole operation. I can go any direction, you know, north, yeah. south, east, west, and I can find deals within um, within within five hours. I got anything. Yeah, and and I mean, pretty much anyone within five hours has put anything to your point. And um, I'm originally from you know the upstate New York area with like the Finger Lakes region, and most of my buying and flipping and selling and building has happened and occurred up there. Now I went mm -hmm. to school and now live down in Florida, the, the Tampa area. And, you know, I, there, the deals are way different for the same bikes or worse bikes. And so to your, to your point, it depends on where you are and deals do pop up. Now, the first step to all this is every day, check Facebook marketplace, like mm -hmm. three times at the bare minimum for at least we got to pop those numbers up those are rookie numbers three three times this is no no no, no. i I'm live on it. i got another the, phone just to the side for, just on marketplace right now. <laughs> for the viewer no for the for all of you watching like if you are you, you get in the rhythm of popping mm -hmm. up facebook a few times throughout the day 
with your various search words. So like for me, I'm a vintage Honda, 70s vintage Honda guy, you know, BMW, Moto Guzzi, um, and like, you know, maybe some Kawasaki stuff. Right? Like the vintage Japanese categorize them as one. And what I always have in my search is like Honda CB, right? And that will kind of give you everything. And yeah. and once you start getting into a rhythm of a few different searches, so BMW R series bikes, and then you start teaching the app that stuff, you won't really have to search for much once it gets into a rhythm because all the deals will pop up on your for you page. Like you just, yeah. no, I, I agree fully. Like you just go, right. You go here. I bet you there's like four deals. I might, he's going to find a deal right so you now. Just open it up. You go to marketplace and all this stuff. Look, you've storage units. Cause I'm looking for storage units down here to transplant MZR mm -hmm. garage down here. But look, like here's a nice KZ 750 for 1500 bucks kind of dilapidated that's an easy $600 deal you know what I mean yeah and like you look at it it's like you just scroll you just scroll a little bit give it time give it time and then you search right and then you have tops for you local and more and as you just start playing around and you start searching deals will start to pop up they won't come to you unless you religiously pop up the app have your keywords, your searches and look and refresh your pages every once in a while. And like, mm -hmm. you will see something that pops up. And this is, it's not something that you just you type in, I, you know, you want to buy a GoPro and you just go into Google type in, I want to buy a GoPro boom. And like, sure. It's yes, you can buy a deal today, but if you want to spend a lot of money, like go for it. Right. Well, but these, all, everything that you said combines though. So you no, through paying little attention little. to marketplace, you know, through paying attention to marketplace religiously, you have an idea of what shows up at what price point. So therefore you have kind of an idea of the market. So then, you know, when a good deal is jumping out at you, at, you know, it just takes persistence, persistency. Yeah. And, and uh, again, you know, as much as we hate, you know, we could all complain about Facebook listening too much or something like that. Or, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get crazy here, but like, you know, you get shown all the ads, it does get good at showing you the bikes that you want to see. It does. And, and so I, after, after a while searching for so long, it, it kind of knows what to show you. That's at least my experience too. Oh, hands down. And you pretty much wrapped up what I was in a nutshell. That's what I was trying to say. I, I went on a little tangent toward the end, but it really, it really comes down to all of the deals. Like if you're not someone with, um, you don't need an Instagram following or a social media following mm -hmm. to find these deals. I, I've maybe had a couple potential deals come across my Instagram DMs, but I'm sure you maybe BJ, you've had quite a few CXs come through your DMs that you. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. I'm but, like, no, no more, no more. But like he, everyone that's going to be in this video talking about their best deals and where they found it, I bet you. Every single answer, the foundation starts with Facebook Marketplace. All right. Craigslist mm -hmm. is yeah, at this, Facebook at this Marketplace point. is the new Craigslist. Like anything on Craigslist is going to be on Facebook for the most part. Um, you know, and and uh so what was my best deal? Mm -hmm. I would like to think that all right, let's just put it in a category of I've had, I think I've owned uh 12 bikes or something mm -hmm. out of the 12, I think nine of them were great deals. Um, but in particular, I scored this past spring in, in at May of 23, I scored three um, KZ 400s, the deluxe version though. They were like mm -hmm. a deluxe, like package, whatever, with the fairing and the rear bags and they were only in brown. And I scored three of them. For the I can't wait to put photos up over this right now. Yeah, yeah, we'll pop. We'll I, pop I, didn't, I didn't preface. I didn't preface this question to you beforehand. So everybody who's watching this, like, I was hoping that he would pick those because I thought that was a particularly cool deal. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So tell I, us about it. About I think of thirteen bikes. I think it's thirteen. But tell us about it. So I, all right, and let's put another thing out there as a little understanding of how everything is always so difficult for me is all, probably every single one of 
my deals has been coordinated over messenger while I'm in Florida, while they're being sold in rap in, in New York. So it's like, mm-hmm. so there's been a few scenarios where I didn't have power of negotiation because I sent a deposit and there's so many people reaching out. It just had already been a decent deal type of thing, you know, but regarding the four, the KZs, the guy that I bought them from bought them from an estate sale from a, a gentleman, the gentleman that passed away with the estate sale. He was a um, diehard KZ deluxe, like fanboy. When I say fan, I bought everything with, you know, three extra seats, um, extra fairings, like 15 manuals, uh, like KZ memorabilia, uh, the deluxe, like magazine articles, newspapers, everything. Like it was, it was a really cool deal. It wasn't just three bikes. It was like everything that came from it in the era. And then some, Oh, that's cool. So So, he was all about the KZ 400s or 440. All about, yeah. yeah. So it was pretty cool. And the guy that I, um, ended up buying them from, he had really no, idea. he like rode motorcycles, but he didn't really have any mechanical, um, you know, bandwidth or want to actually bring them back to life. He just probably bought all three for like a thousand bucks or something or mm-hmm. 1500 bucks from the estate sale. And so I viewed it as, all right, I have no need for these. I don't necessarily have the money for it, but I know that if I, if I get my hands on these, I will be able to make 100% profit because I bought three for, for 1800 bucks. So at that point you get one of them running, your money's already back. Right. Right. So, so like you got to You got to use money to make money and stuff like that. And it's, you know, I'll I'll be talking with Eric later, but I know he's going to bring up this whole paperclip idea, trading up, trading paperclip for a house, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yes. I, you know, I, it was cool because you and I were, you know, talked about that deal before you bought them huh? and I just thought it was, it was such a cool thing. And yeah, I think individually, um, if it was just one KZ 400, 440, whatever, like it wasn't that special, but no. man, there were three matching bikes. It was like the matching fairings and they were clean and it was just like, it, it was, was different. Weird. It was weird. Like yeah. they were like, when I say triplets, they were triplets and I imagine the gentleman that originally owned them probably, oh, actually I had, I had receipts from two of them were bought on eBay for like 300 bucks. Like, so way back, way back in the day. And so I would imagine that he was an older gentleman and he was looking to make an immaculate one version of the deluxe through the three that he had. Cause there was mm-hmm. extra parts. There was good parts on one bad parts on the other. So like there was a one, uh, all of them were under 10,000 miles too on the engine. That was another, okay. that was a huge plus. And like, yeah, that's gonna add. what was really appealing to me was the triplets. Okay. Like you said, if it was just one of them for 1500 bucks listed, I probably wouldn't have bought it. Right. Because well, and they're orange too. It's just like they're orange. They popped. You know, if they're black, they would even be different, you know? Right. Maybe. And, and it's so like a boring color for me, it's like, all right, if that's a CB 750 and mostly original form for $1,500, I'll buy it even though I don't need it because I know it's three grand or I know it can be four grand or 2,500 at the very least. Like that's an easy flip because CB 750s are hot and will always be hot. Right. Yeah. But a KZ 400 is it's not very desirable, right. To the masses. And so when I saw three of them, I thought that was a good opportunity to try to at least get one of the three running, which I did. And then I listed up in the forums, you know, two for the price of one, both running. Mm -hmm. And so a gentleman came in from Boston and uh, he scooped up the two that uh, I got two of the three running. I'm sorry. And uh, the one that I sold to him, or he he bought two, he bought the one non-running and then he bought the one that I got running on one cylinder. And uh, so that deal, you know, made out pretty well. And then um, uh, I saved the third one just for me because like I got a free bike out of it and it only had, I don't know, I think it was like 3,100 miles on it. And so I, yeah, and so you, but you're still sitting on that one. Like that's something, 
you know, uh, you that can, one was that one. If you need to profit. sell it, you can always sell it. Yeah. yeah, that that one is pure profit in the end. Um, I, you know, I made money. My I made my money back plus a little bit from selling the two, and then the third one. Um, I enjoyed it for a couple months. I rode it around. I took some parts off the other two to get it running, like a set of carbs and whatever. And uh, I never got it like fully dialed in just because I didn't have the time or patience. But I got it running, mm -hmm. riding great. Like the brakes were good. Everything was good. I put new tires on it. And then I sold that one for what it was worth at the time. And just, yeah. so uh, that was probably um, the coolest deal. Um, but in a nut, I mean, pretty much every one of them has been great. Now, now we talked, we talked about how you found the deal and stuff like that. So were there any, um, you're sitting in Florida and you messaged a guy then. It's like, how did you, how did you lock it down? You said you did a deposit. So actually it's funny because I saw the deal and it was actually timing worked out pretty well. So the deal popped up the weekend I was graduating from undergrad mm -hmm. from college and my family was in whatever. And it popped up and I'm like, oh, mom, you gotta let me, you gotta let me put these three bikes in the garage. A little bit, little bit more space. Yeah, because I'm I'm still I'm I'm I've completely taken over the third bay at the house. And you know, I've kind of started to push into the second, the middle bay a little bit. So <laughs> I gotta keep my shoulders are are pretty broad these days, but no, um, it was funny. So then I was like, listen, give give it like three weeks or a month. I know I'll be able to flip them and like it'll be good. Just let me let me be able to do this. Great somehow convinced her to let me do it. And I was messaging, messaging the guy um, the day before I was heading home from, from college and uh, whatever. He's like, Oh, I got a lot of people. I got a lot of people. I'm like, oh, dude, I'll send you like 200 bucks. So I just Venmo him 200 bucks. And at that point, if I was home, if I was home and he listed it and I was over there and like, you know, saw it listed 20 minutes ago type of scenario, drove over mm -hmm. there. I could have gotten a way better deal, but since it was a deposit, I needed like a week of time until I could pick them up. And, um, we negotiated, I was able to get them down a little bit. I was like, ah, oh, you know, college kid, this is my business. Dude, you, you, you're not going to get it if you don't ask for it. Buy and know? flip. Yeah. So like, that's another thing, um, how it goes down and like, how do we get these deals? It, it really starts with just being strict on, if you're really persistent and you really want a particular bike, stay on looking on, stay on Facebook marketplace periodically, check it throughout the days. And before you know it, a month will go by and the perfect deal will pop up. All right. Yeah. All right. And once you get to that point, depending on your situation, there's always room to warm up to each other, tell them the story, what your plans are kind of, I got a dent here. I'm going to have to do the clutch, you know, boom, there's like a hundred bucks. Would you mind, you know, taking a hundred bucks off? Great. The tires are dry rotted, you know? So there's, there's ways to kind of, you found the bike, you get to the bike, assess it. You know, they're never as perfect as they appear on Facebook. Absolutely not. You no. Know? And unless you're buying like a CB 750 fully restored for 12 grand, that might be different, but what it's pictured on Facebook, right? It's, it's always different, whether it's better or worse, that's determined once you get there, but just needs carbs cleaned, you know, just like, it's, yeah, like no, just needs carbs needs a lot cleaned. more than that might need, you know, your, your front, the front forks might be seized or the brake, the brakes are clogged or whatever. Like that stuff adds up a little bit. So then you can kind yeah. of, if you have a, a, an awareness of what actually goes into getting it back to a good riding condition, then there's, there's actual negotiation power, right? Because then you can decipher right. and filter out any BS that the seller is trying to throw at you. Right. Um, yeah. This could be like, Oh man, just, just negotiations could be whole nother, an entire, whole, whole, yeah, an could, entire episode. Because like, for me, if I list something, I list it with room. Unless it's like so dirt cheap, there's been many deals. I, I'm in a hurry to get there because I know it's dirt cheap. Right. I don't even try to negotiate and just like, here's the money. Right. That's what I, I don't mean. even, I don't even, I don't even try because it's like, it's worth it just to get in and get out and be first. Yeah. And you I know, know, and I know I'm probably 
you know, reel me back if I'm going a little off rail and kind of down a rabbit hole. But today it's really just talking about, I've, I've had really good deals. I've been fortunate for that, but it also comes down to my willingness to involve myself into the hobby has allowed mm-hmm. the ability to get those pretty good deals. Right. Like yeah. when I was first in this, first getting into this, I mean, I didn't buy my set. I didn't buy my CB750 for a good price, really at all. When I first got into this this hobby, I, you know, I didn't really know the market. I didn't know what bikes were of value. I didn't know how to fix really any of this stuff. And yeah, same. yeah right. And like some of you watching may be in the same boat. And it's like shoot a DM to any of these guys on this call here today, right? Like we can maybe help yeah, you in the direction. And, you know, outside of that, just use your best judgment, search CB 750, notice a trend of what everything is being listed for. Cause that'll give you a gauge of like maybe $2,000 of range that though that particular bike that you're looking for is being listed for. Right. And just because it's listed for that price doesn't mean that's what they're selling for, but that'll give you a general idea of like, if mm-hmm. something's listed for 4,200, the odds are it sells for 38. Yeah. Four yeah, so, like my, my kind of like if it's if it's at that range, yeah, if it's listed at four grand, I'm I'm going away with it for probably thirty five hundred bucks. Exactly. You know? And if not, and so like, and this is another thing. Go into these go into these negotiation and deals with all right. Like this is the amount I have to spend, and if I can't get to this number, right, don't buy unless it's something that turns out to be way better in way better shape than you anticipated. Where if you do end up mm-hmm. paying that extra two to four hundred dollars, that's you know money that you wouldn't have to spend to actually do the work on, if it was a different bike or whatever. But now here's a here's a t- uh, quick tip I just thought of. So, let's say your budget it, you put a max price in. If some people filter it by price, so let's say you put a max price in of twenty five hundred bucks, and that's your hard line, which is fair. If you put your max price in at twenty five hundred, you're gonna eliminate all those bikes that are listed at three thousand yeah. that you might be able to yeah. get for twenty five hundred. So right. if you're gonna put in your max price, put it in a little higher and that way you can work on maybe negotiating down, you know. Yeah. Um connecting dots between when I went to go pick up the KZs, we'll pick up from there. So okay. went to uh when I went to go pick up the KZs, you know, we struck a deal. We landed on a price. He was pretty, pretty firm on, on price. Um, and actually it was pretty cool because I had two or I think two or I'll pop up a video right here. I'll give BJ the video to pop up, but it was cool. It was one of the coolest scenarios trailing three identical KZs on the trailer and one in the flatbed of the truck back home. It was like one of the coolest things. I think I make, I made a reel out of it and I don't know that whole deal was something that a, you know, the bikes aren't really my taste, but the bikes are in the era of mechanics that I understand and within my, you know, within my ability. So I knew I can do something to create more value. Um, putting my whole goal was to put $0 into them and do my best to get them in a point where they're at maybe running or whatever. I put new tires. Like what I think the only money I spent was new tires on one of them. And, Mm -hmm. and that was the one that I was keeping and I had already made the profit back, but, um, yeah, the KZs were a great experience. They taught me a lot. They let me, uh, get introduced to a new platform. I've never worked on the the Kawasaki series or the KZ series. Um, and so they were honestly, my whole experience from the KZs that gave a whole new appreciation for me to the Japanese bikes, especially the Kawasaki bikes, because, that was the smoothest, easiest, and comfiest riding bike I had ever ridden in the Japanese bikes that I've ridden. That thing was like zero vibration, let your hands off, cruise through the wind, like enough. That's interesting. Enough wind was being blocked from that diffuser, but an, enough wind was getting to my body where it was good, like flow. And yeah. the stability on that bike was incredible wasn't the fastest bike it wasn't the torqueriest bike in by any stretch but the comfort on that it was like too easy to ride that i like was bored 
That's how smooth it was. Hmm. That's interesting. I've actually, I've never ridden one of those. Yeah. I have, I've very, I've like not, not intentionally, but I have very little Kawasaki experience in other than my KLR and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. You I have, you no have the, you have the, it. the KZ uh, 650 that you built or 750. Well, yeah, that's 750 twin, but yeah, that was the first bike. That's just, I don't even remember what it sounds like, it, you know, I would love to get in the Kawasaki's, but they're just, the ones that I want to get into are just way too expensive to start out. Yeah. Yeah. Z ones and stuff like that. I wouldn't mind doing a, a 440 chopper. Yeah. Those things look so cool. Hardtailed, but yeah. yeah. Um, but so I don't know. Guys, to wrap it up guys, like my advice for my experiences would be just, let's put it this way. I looked for my CB. So I don't know if anyone's aware, but I built a CB 750. It was my first true oh. build. Yeah. Right behind you. Yeah right there. And I was looking for maybe f five months before I stumbled across a CB 750 that was in a price price range that I could afford. And I was never intending to buy a super sport version of the CB 750s. I actually didn't even know, th know those existed at the time. But it was the only CB750 that I saw on my page for under or at $2,000 for six months time. So, you know, and it was an hour and a half away from my house. So my advice would be, if you really want a particular model bike, give it a little time, but stay persistent and um, really just, I, I don't know much more than that, honestly. Just stay persistent day, on the, Facebook. Yeah, the, the and, day after you give up looking, the deal's going to pop up the next yeah. one, you know. Yeah, and it's frustrating, but you will stop there. The market for CB750s is inflated. The market for vintage motorcycles is inflated. But if if anyone here is going to prove that inflation wrong and that it's possible to find incredible deals still to this day, it's BJ and Eric um, a motorcycle rewind. And, you know, I've managed to do a fraction of what they've done, but deals and good deals are out there. We can go mm -hmm. down the whole conversation with each and every one of the guys that are speaking to BJ in this episode with every single deal that we've went through and really shed light and give justice to that deals are out there. So if you want a deal, oh, you yeah. find it, stick at it and uh, reach out to people with any questions like us, if you ever, yeah. If you ever so well that's perfect i do appreciate it um yeah, i can't yeah. wait to post this this is gonna be such a fun episode and, and it's gonna be really insightful so so yeah i i do appreciate it just such a fun episode but uh yeah definitely check thomas out and everybody else in this video again they will be linked in the description so yeah i appreciate you doing this no problem bj thank you and everyone reach out to me with any questions and uh we're one team one family thanks for being the dopest crew out there so there you go. I like that even better. So this this guy right here in this uh, nice red jacket I just uh, started admiring here does not need an introduction, but this is Eric of Motorcycle Rewind. And um, you, sir, are probably the authority to talk to on wheeling the deal and making deals on bikes, how to find deals. And uh, yeah, that's why you're here. So I, I, you have a lot of experience with this. I don't know if I'm an authority. I'm just a, a cheap motorcycle connoisseur. Yeah. So I just don't like spending any money. That's that's part of the other thing. It's I'm I'm a cheapskate. It when it comes to buying motorcycles, and I I think you probably know this because you've seen it happen. You've talked to people all the time that they spend too much money on something that's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think that happens more often than not. And so. I like I got a message the other day from a guy that said, you know, I've, I've listed everything about the motorcycle, what the guy wants for it. But then he said what his budget is. Mm -hmm. Well, then <laughs> you've got to stick to your budget. You offer him that. And if he doesn't take it, you move on. You go find another one. I think too many people get uh, emotional. Mm -hmm. Right. With it. My, my father said this once and uh, it's probably the best bit, bit of advice he ever gave me is you can't let desire overrule good judgment. That's true. There's been there's been a couple times where it's like I've gone to look at something and I really want it, you know, and I 
oof, it's tempting to just go ahead and pull the trigger on something when it just doesn't make sense, you know? Yeah, you know, and, and I'm not mean to people. I, I tell them, I said, look, this is what I, I'll give you for it. And, and if you don't want it, that's good. We'll still be friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to take it personally. You have your offer it for something. I'm willing to give you this if you want it. It's good. If not, we're still good. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I, I know you've go just ahead. got a lot of experience with it. I like your outlook on, you know, making deals and and you're just very at at the front. You're just very kind with people and fair. And, and like you said, you can you can part ways as friends. And it's fine. Yeah. So, you know, and and, you know, I and, and we'll get into that. But you have to be willing to uh, you have to be honest with yourself and what you want to pay and and then don't go over that. Mm hmm. You know, and be willing to walk away. Yeah. I drove, I, I went to, uh, end of the year last year, went to the auction at Barber, just not to go buy anything, but just to be there for a friend of mine was selling a huge lot of motorcycles. So I just wanted to go watch it. And while I was up there, so I'm going to the Barber, Barber Museum that's having this huge auction. So I go buy these two piece of crap 350s, Honda 350s that were in Georgia, maybe an hour away. So I drove all the way up there. And we had talked, I talked to one guy and what the price was. When I got there, the price was like $400 more oh. for the pair. And I was like, look, I was willing to pay this. I went there for seven. He wanted six a piece. And then I said, I was hoping to pay $400 for it. And if not, I have no problem driving away in an empty truck. You know, I had a good time. I listened to the music all the way up there. I listened to the music all the way back. I'm still going to be good. Not yeah. going to be mad at this guy. And sure enough, we talked a little while longer. And I said, okay, man, I'll see you later. And he said, how about $500? I said, sold. Load yeah. it in the back of the truck. We'll move on. It, it's that point when, when, you gotta, when you're willing to walk away from it is when you have all the leverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you put the power back in, on, in your or put the ball back in your court, so to speak. So. Yeah. yeah you now, know, before, so, before we get too, too far ahead here. Um, cause I know you're, you're full of all kinds of, you know, experience and advice and stuff like that. Uh, I just want to kind of format this. So I've been asking everybody three questions. Okay. So the first is what do you feel the best deal you've ever got on a bike is? And I guess, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a bike, but, uh, yeah, in that sense also I've been framing it. Like it doesn't have to be like a monetary thing, but just to you, what feels like the best deal you've ever got? Yeah. The second part is. Uh, what did you do to make that deal ha happen? Like, how did you negotiate it? You know, how did you how did you make it happen? And then the third would be advice for other people looking to get good deals on these bikes, because um, I'm sure you get this comment, but I know I get it a lot is like, how do you find these deals? So that's what this video is all about. Yeah. So, well, uh, let's which one do you want to start with? Because we can go either way. Number one. Number one. So we'll start. Best with deal you've got. So it, it's how. The, the, I'm, I'm struggling with your question, but I'll, I'll, I'll frame it. The reason why I'm struggling with it. So the best deal I ever got or the, the, the cheapest I ever paid for a motorcycle or, or the obviously would be the free one that I got, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, but, but that doesn't fit the question, right? It's uh, the best deal probably was uh, that I ever made on a motorcycle was actually a moped with a pedal start moped. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a funny story. It was a Peugeot, I think a 104. And it was when we were living in Connecticut. My wife and I had this uh, little Volkswagen Cabrio, uh, late 90s, something like that, little convertible. We used to I know keep, what those are. Yeah. So we used to keep a uh, bike rack in the trunk of it because if we were ever out and we saw a moped and we had ratchet straps in there, you ratchet strap the because most mopeds are step throughs. Mm -hmm. It'll start moped. So you ratchet strap from the, the seat to the steering, and then you can just stick it right on a, on a uh, bike rack on the back of a Volkswagen Cabrio. <laughs> so I had found this uh, Peugeot and the guy wanted like $400 for it. And there was no way I was going to spend that money. And I go to get it. The engine seized. It's, it's all crappy. And I said, look, man, I said, this, and the guy was huge. The guy was like 6'3", maybe 240. And I was like, holy crap, this guy's going to beat the crap out of me when he asked me. He goes, I said, look, man, this is what I'll give you. I'll give you 50 bucks for it. And you can <laughs> laugh at me when I put it on the back of that car. You know, and he said, I can't do $50. And 
And then so I reached in my pocket and I pulled that. You know, you you play the the money game. You don't put all your money in one pocket and pull it out. You put it in Eric, the other. We're not one. supposed to give away all of our deepest darkest secrets because I play that one too. And look, you do. I pulled out and I said, "All I have," and I had like twenty four dollars. <laughs> so I paid seventy four dollars for this moped. Mm-hmm. And then I did strap it on the back of the Volkswagen and we drove away. You know, it's kind of one of those things. It, it's just because they're asking whatever for it doesn't mean that's what they're going to take for it well how how is this thing listed you're driving around you saw one like on the side of the road or was it like a craigslist okay so it's craigslist what um, when was this this was so we moved to moved back to louisiana 15 years ago so 2005 seven somewhere there eight so we mentioned craigslist multiple times like in this what will be this episode and uh, like any more, Craigslist really isn't isn't yeah. a thing. You know, it, it's still there, but not to the extent that it used to be back then. You know, and, and to that point, uh, maybe this is going to get a little ahead, so I'll hold up. I don't ever negotiate beforehand. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same. Uh, you know, I, I whether I'm buying or selling, I, I just don't do it. I, I don't think it's I don't, I don't think it's fair that either part either party. You're going to commit to something you had not even looked at it yet. Come on. It's right. it, we're not going to do. I will show up when I when I say I'm going to show up and I'll do those things. But I, I would think probably the best if in context, probably the best deal. That was the best price I ever paid for a motorcycle from where it started to where I walked away from. Um, but the best deal I ever made on a motorcycle was when I bought my. Uh, it was a 1962 Pook. Uh, Sears Allstate Twingle, 250 Twingle, little Pook Twingle. And um, I bought it. We were traveling. When we were traveling for work, we knew we were going to be in uh, New England. So I'm cruising Marketplace in New England. I find this. And this is four weeks before we get there. I talked to the guy. I ended up messaging him, talked to him on the phone. We have a great conversation. You know how it is. You yeah. find kindred spirits, right? As long as you form a relationship with you, they're okay. And and I said, look, I'm not going to be up there until then. He goes, no problem. I'll hold it. I said, if you need to sell it before I get up there, sell it. You know, no problem. We're still going to be friends, right? Yeah, it's, I used I'm to not going to hit him with that too. Like, hey, I yeah. won't be able to, I won't be available for a week. But you know, if somebody comes along, don't hold it for me. But you know, yeah. let me know. And people people want to be nice to each other. Mm-hmm. We just have to give them the opportunity to. Okay. You know, it's it's so if you, if you do it because it, now they feel like they're doing a good deed. Sure enough, I got we looked it got up there. We looked at it. We had a shipper pick it up, and then that was it. It was like you can make these deals without. Um, it seems like marketplace is always a fight. Meaning, some people post ads because uh, if it's available, don't ask if it's available. Well, you know that's the first thing that Facebook gives me. Right. But but again, I need I don't care how what you say. I respond to everyone, whether whether you're asking crazy questions or not. I actually like the crazy questions because I get to have fun with them. But I respond to them because you never know if you're going to like if you're selling something if, like you and I, we we'll probably end up having more than one motorcycle for sale. We may only have one listing. So if I'm I always think of the hardest thing you can do is get somebody to reply to your ad. So. I might as well farm all that that's coming to me and build relationships with those people. Cause you never know, you know, it's, and yeah, you, never yeah. know. It, you do get crazy people. I, I love the, I love the, how fast does it go? That's my favorite one. I don't really get those. I just, I've never, I don't think I've ever sold anything to anybody that asks if it's available, just to be honest, you know, out of the thousands of people that have messaged yeah. me that literally Nobody, because they never reply. So what I what I normally do with my listings on Marketplace is I will let, you know, the first line is please read the entire ad, you know, and then I put all of my details, a very detailed description, detailed photos. And then at the very end, I'm like, if you read this far, you're awesome. Respond with the code word like cheeseburger or whatever, you know, and I'll get back to you right away. Otherwise, I will delete your message. So if they ask if it's available, I just delete it. And I know that's probably harsh, but like, I don't have the time to go through all of them, you know, no, it's, it, it's, it, it can become a full-time job really quickly. The, the challenge, and I wish Craigslist would come back. I, I don't think it will because that's not where people are. Uh, 
Facebook, it's too easy to be scrolling marketplace and hit uh, available, 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 but you're not interested in it. You're just, you're just driving down the road. You're seeing billboards and you're going, yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. But, and (laughs) you don't even know what you, what you, what you, I responded to once one. And uh, this woman goes, I didn't even know I clicked on it. Yeah. You know, and there's, uh, I should, I should have thought ahead. There was a whole interaction that I had with somebody and I had saved it. I think I still saved it. Just this whole thing. They, she had messaged the wrong person and we ended up having this entire crazy interaction (laughs) with this woman from another, it was bananas, but it was, it was so much fun because I, I was, I was just screwing with her. Right. And just going down. Yeah, I, got, I got the thing. <laughs> yeah. We had just going whatever it was. And we're going through this whole thing. And it is it was bananas. I'll have to dig and see if I could find it one day. I'll send it to you. But it it was just nuts. I mean, I was like. But but that's my thought. You know, I, I've also I've also sold motorcycles in, when trying to buy motorcycles from people. OK. Hey, why just having information, just talking to them. Hey, why are you selling it? Oh, it's because it's busted. You know, well, you know, are you looking, are you replacing it? You know, just didn't have it. You end up having a conversation with them. And I got one of these. Or would you be into that? Yeah, I'd be totally into it. Mm-hmm. So it end up it's you never know what. I, I guess, know. you know, I guess I, I recently kind of did that with the um, my two, the, the CB 450s was like uh, Nighthawks or whatever they were. You know, I had acquired two of them and then this guy was interested in him. I had him listed. And then in the background of his photo, he just randomly sent me a picture of his bike that he was working on. But behind it was a CB 450 T and I'm like, is that for sale? So did a trade plus cash. And, you know, I, I eliminated one bike, but yeah, that was kind of a same similar situation. Yeah. You know, and I, th- I think that goes on to when we're buying and selling it, right. It's all about, having this the relation, building this relationship with people so they feel comfortable doing it and go on from yeah. there. It's uh, like the the crazy thing, the American Eagle, the 750, that Laverta yeah. that's been rebadged. That came, I how that whole thing came about was from a, uh, a CB350 I had for sale on Marketplace and the guy messaged me. Mm-hmm. He about the bike and he goes, Hey, I've got this. Would you be interested in, in helping me get it back together? And I said, yeah, I've never heard of it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah. I mean, and, I said, if, if somebody sent me something like that, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't turn that away. I, I'd have been like, that's, yeah. that's interesting, you know, cause yeah. it's kind of hard to find from, I mean, I'm on the other side of it, but from what I've seen, it's hard to find people to work on older bikes like this, right. especially like vintage right. stuff. So yeah, yeah, people have to take, you know, any avenue they can find basically that's it um before before we get too too far away from that initial uh-huh. deal so the moped you bought it you know he wanted 400 bucks you offered him 50 you walked away 74 dollars yep. 74 dollars yep. okay so how did you get him down from 400 to 74 i was honest you know i think when people I think people, and we run into that all the time, and and we'll frame this with this. You can always tell the Facebook uh, ad, marketplace ad, when it's still strapped to a trailer. Yeah. That they just picked it up somewhere they don't know what they have. Mm -hmm. Or they think they have more than what it is. So if you have, if, if you can show up like this one particular guy, the guy didn't know what he had. He thought he had something. And when I started telling him what he had, what it was missing, what's there, why I didn't even know it had that, or I didn't know that's what it did. Then he goes, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Right. And then, so look, based on what it is right here, this is what I'm going to give you. And, you know, if you're okay with that, we're good. If not, that's it. And I went from 400, we didn't go I, I 50 bucks and then I'm going to drive away. I mean, it's, it's no problem. Um, and he said it'd take a little bit more, but and I gave him seventy four dollars. Okay, kind of the same thing. My my son, my youngest son Eric, when he was a senior in high school, right before his yep yeah, senior in high right before his senior year, he wanted a car and he'd save money all summer and ended up finding this little uh, Audi A four. Right, we we're in mm-hmm. Connecticut and it was it was rough, but it's a good first car, and. um, we go, the guy wanted 
twenty uh, two uh, two plus thousand dollars far, and Eric had enough money, but he wasn't going to spend that. And he pulled out the money he had, and it's like eleven hundred bucks. And then he had to beg his mom for some money, and she goes, "All I have is like twelve dollars." And sure enough, he had eleven hundred and twelve dollars. And he counted stack of money, counted out, put it on the guy's hood, and the wind blew, and a dollar blew off of it. And Eric goes, eleven hundred and eleven dollars. <laughs> right the timing just, the timing just is like perfect. right away it's like it's going away man and sure enough the guy took the money you know if, <laughs> if you just if you just hold true so i i love buying motorcycles for odd numbers that is like this one. well yeah that's 74 dollars you know yeah that little uh that cl 350 that's back there that my daughter drew i paid 206 dollars for it 206 okay because the guy wanted more than 200 reach in my pocket all i had was six dollars and he said okay I, I but they've have had any like that but that's funny though but they feel like they're winning i have given you everything i have you know like everything here's some pocket lint you know look man you asked for more i gave you more like my watch i got a nice watch you yeah know? it's it's what, what we can do you know it's the other thing that um I, I'm super fortunate that my wife is such a trooper when it comes to this stuff. And she is the best bargaining power. Oh, ever. yeah. You've brought this up before. So, yeah, I, I'm, I think the audience will enjoy this. So the game that we play, and we used to do this when we go pick up mopeds. When we lived in Connecticut, just did pedal start mopeds because you can find them anywhere, is that she would get mad and storm away and go, there's no way you're spending that much money. And automatically, the guy is now on my side. Mm -hmm. He knows what that car ride could be like, and he doesn't want to do it to me. And it is so funny, but it's just a game, right? And if you're willing to play it and you have it's fun with it, you just, it's kind of evil, you, but it's smart. Yeah, you <laughs> know, it, it, you. But, but if you're willing to have fun with it yeah, and don't take it, I can't believe he wouldn't take it. Well, that's okay if he doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's his to sell. It's his decision to make or her decision to make and just enjoy it. Enjoy the process, as they say. Yeah. And you're not forcing that person to sell it for no. X price. You know, it doesn't no. it, you know, that's not what it's about. And yeah, it's ultimately his decision. So, yeah, um, yeah you got it. You know, you don't don't hate the player, hate the game, you know. Yeah. Just that that CL 360 I bought just a, a month ago. Oh, my gosh. The one was listed put the video up like it, as of today it was I think yesterday right? Oh no, that's the uh, that's the SL. Oh, SL. 350. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but uh, so, so many bikes. bikes. But but the CL uh, 360, I bought it was listed for 175 dollars, and I'm like I go to the guy I said look I'll be there, and I get the meeting first thing in the morning, and I look it over I said hey what do you? We opened the seat I could see the owner's manual under the the little tray so i'm like oh, this is it what what do you want for it he goes the least i'll take is 125 dollars. i said sold i mean he already beat it down for me he did the work for me i didn't even have to That's hurt a him tough one you know I, I get hit with that question my friend has told me before you know i can't buy it and sell it you know yeah. so, like that's that's a tough one when somebody's like what's the lowest you'll go i'm like what's the most you'll give i, I don't know like, yeah but, give me yeah. you give me something you know yeah yeah and and so he just said, I, I just acted like I didn't know what the price was. Yeah, that's that, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And uh, and he just said, I'll take this. Okay, no problem. It's here you go, sold. Shook his well, hand. You know, you had already proved to him that you're not there to waste his time. You you yeah. showed up in person, and and to me that says something. You know, because if somebody just wants to try to negotiate over the phone or whatever, or like just what you know, what's your bottom dollar? Like that drives me crazy. I'm like, no, this no. person's not buying it. I'll, I'll give you six hundred dollars for it, and I'll pick it up right now, cash. I'm like, no, man, you don't even know it, it, when it's listed for twenty five hundred dollars or yeah. something like that. Yeah, if you showed up and we could talk about that's the other thing. Just show up on time. Oh Just yeah, do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it, and they're going to be more receptive. If you make the guy wait a half hour, he's not going to deal with you. Oh yeah, yeah, that that clock is ticking. You know, yeah, the irritation level after your set time for meeting is like. You know, every minute it's exponential. Oh, so yeah. No, I had a, I had a person one time. I had a, a oh, what was this a, Vol a Kawasaki Vulcan 500? 
Mm -hmm. And it's a little 500 twin and I had got it out of a dealership. Anyway, like I had it for sale for, I don't know, eight, 800 bucks, something like that. I don't even remember. Yeah. And uh, this person was messaging me and um, was like, you know, what's least you'll give or whatever. It's like, I've got, how about like 600 bucks? And I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. Like come with 600 bucks yeah. and that'd be cool. So we, we agree on a time. He comes and uh, checks it out and he has like $400 on him. And he, and he's like, that's, would you do 400? I'm like, we already agreed to the, this number. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. no, I'm like, he came with like a, a few buddies and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, see what your buddies have. I'm, you know, you, you, yeah. we agreed on a number. This is what, this is your doing, you know? Right. And so I can't remember how much they, you know, scrounged together, but uh, you know, we agreed on a price and then he's got to go load it up and they brought a truck, but they didn't bring any straps. Oh gosh. And so, so like they're getting ready to load it. And I'm like, you have any straps? They're like, no, I'm, I'm like, there's a Walmart back over yeah. here. Here's 20 bucks. I gave him 20 bucks back. Go buy some straps. You know, yeah. they drove, went to the store, came back just like, come on. So it, that might've been their first deal that they were trying to work. Yeah. Experience, you know, it's, uh, it's so funny. I was just thinking about that when, when you were saying there was, so I used to, when we get these mopeds ever, I, I buy and sell a lot of these things just because it keeps the hobby moving. Plus I'm, I have a little ADD. I don't have a lot of it. I have just enough for me um, that I, I get bored with what I have. So I tend to, to move them on. And I had this pedal start moped. It was a Gorelli uh, super sport for sale, uh, $900 guy came to look at it, offered me 600 bucks. I said, Ben, look, the best I could do is eight. And we rode it around for probably a half hour. And uh, I was on another one. And so then he messaged me later and said, 600 bucks, I can do it. And I said, oh, you know, let me think about this. So I went and rode it. And I, I came back. No, he had offered me seven and uh, via text. And I went and rode it. And I sent him a message and said, look, man, I just got back. I just rode the thing for about a half hour. It's $900. Mm -hmm. And he goes, how about eight? And I said, sold. <laughs> we ended up right because he was like hold on he's negotiating the wrong way it's uh -huh. getting more expensive it's like uh, i don't know what to do with this but yeah it's somebody else said there, there's a butt for every seat so mm -hmm. it's not this guy there's somebody else yeah i'm just trying to be patient i got like i got a few things for sale right now i'm just i'm trying to be patient you know yeah it's yeah. the wrong time to be selling so um yeah what uh so what what advice would you have for others i know we kind of like kind of fired off the conversation with yeah. a lot of advice, but if you had to maybe give one or two takeaways, you know, what's some, what's some good advice. So for, for buying and selling. Other right, than to have a things. carry with you to, right. to negotiate. That's it, man. Look, and she is available if anybody needs it. Um, the uh, for, for buying is stick to your budget, whatever your budget is mm -hmm. and try to shoot for under budget. That I, I think majority of people get into, maybe they want to get into a vintage motorcycle and they go, okay, I want to spend a thousand dollars and they look for a thousand dollar motorcycle, but they don't realize they got to buy tires. They got to buy all this other stuff. They may have to buy yeah. a battery. You're going to have to do some work. You have to change the oil already just in tires, battery and change the oil. We spent over 200 bucks. Yeah. So, so you got to keep that in mind when you're going at it and you, that's why you have to come in under budget. You, you just have to. And you have to, I always look at it is if I ever have to fire sale this stuff, will I be able to get from out from underneath it? That's a good, that's a good thing to think about. You know, if I had to, if I had to, gener if I had to turn all that garage into cash, how long would it take me? Mm -hmm. Right. That's kind of the way I look at it and, and me make money, not losing money on it, but still making money on it. And you do that from buying it on the, buying it right. Yeah. And not overspending in the beginning. And so that's where, uh, where I think really focusing on that in the beginning, but when you're selling is make your ads interesting that people want to read. Uh, th that's, that's a, that's a good point. You know, not just, not just detailed and like sterile, so to speak, but yeah, make them interesting. It's the, the ones that like go viral or like funny ads, you know, like yeah. they're trying to sell a Toyota Camry and talking about how it's the best thing in the world. And it's just like, that's funny, you know? Look, I, I always, uh, you tap into what, whatever's there, right? So I had a, 
a CB450 I was selling. I think it was a 70 or 71. And um, so I look up what was the popular song at that time. And it was uh, Country Road by uh, John Denver. Yeah. So, well, obviously the album cover is one of the pictures in the ad. And the, the copy of the ad starts off with how great you can hear the song playing as you're riding down the country road. The guy that bought it said he couldn't get the song out of his head. And, you know, find a way to connect with people that uh, just That's different. Good. As opposed to, yeah, you know, just thinking through this a little bit more as opposed to saying the least amount. And do yourself a favor. If you did just go buy it and it's ratchet strapped to your trailer, take it off the trailer and actually wash it. <laughs> or or don't put, I know what I have, and it's got a pile of old dirty laundry on top of it. Mm -hmm. Right? At least, at least make it look presentable so that you can sell it. Too many people just they take a quick photograph as opposed to staging it and making it look good. Yeah. And that, that, is that lead photo and now video on marketplace, you know, that the video I've been trying to take advantage of too, but photos are everything. There's it's amazing how good of photos these take and how bad some of the sales listings are. It's like, ugh, like shaking like that, or they're looking over here and the bikes over there. They can't even it's uh, unbelievable. It's, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, the one thing I found, and this is uh, a byproduct of having a YouTube channel that I never thought of, is it's the As Seen on TV. That is, uh, it's a strange one, isn't it? it? It is, because if I can list all the, does it run? Hold on, there's six videos on this motorcycle, so you can know everything about it. The uh, That orange CB750 that, I, that yeah. I've had in a few videos, so I had made two on it whenever I was uh, servicing the bike, bringing it back to life right. for the customer. And that customer ended up selling it to somebody else local, and whenever he was selling it, that person mentioned my videos. And so yeah. automatically, that guy can watch that video, those videos, right. and say, oh, this is like, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what's been done to it, like yeah. way more trustworthy and... Yeah. And that bike has like, it can command more value, not regardless of who the, did the video, but just knowing that that work was done. Right, right. And, and so I, even though I, I list every video that, you know, I'll, I'll have a link to it in the ad, the videos that are there, I always, in my videos, I, I always let people know what I paid for them, for them, right? If I paid $125 for that CL360, doesn't mean I sold it for $175. I sold it for $1,600 which was still a fair price for a running, riding CL360. You, you see, so what I paid for it is irrelevant to what it's worth. That's interesting. So you put what you've paid for it in the listings. Well, no, in my, my videos that I do. Oh, my okay, YouTube okay. Videos. I was going to say that, that would be a strength. For... Yeah, no. Okay. okay. No, so I, I have no problem telling people that, you know, I got the GPZ for free. I got the GPZ for free doesn't mean it's worthless. Right, right. You know, so it's just because I bought it right doesn't mean it's it's cheap. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, or that was not the work. leg work that you did, you know. Yeah, you know. And so that that's kind of the, the interesting things where a lot of people, they, I don't want to tell people what I paid for it. Well, you probably paid too much because if you paid too little, you always tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody wants, everybody's okay with sharing that. Well, that's awesome, though. Um you got yeah, you got a lot, you got a lot of good good info there, you know, some well, you know. ninja stuff. And uh yeah, interesting stories for sure. And I know you have plenty more, but you know, no, this is gonna be a fun episode to put out. I'm really excited about it. Dude, man, thanks for the opportunity to do this. This was loads of fun. No, yeah, of course. I know it's just a short one and we could we could go on and on with it, but uh yeah, yeah. Um Guys, I will have, like I said, I, I will have everybody's information in the description. So be sure to check out all the channels, especially, you know, Eric's and everybody. So, um, again, I appreciate you doing this one. And, uh, yeah, get back to hustling on whatever you're hustling on today. That's it, man. Cleaning scooters. Yeah. Well. <laughs> all right, man. Make them good. Yeah. Talk to you later. Bye. All right, everybody, on the screen is actually me because I forget how Zoom works, but uh, I'm joined here by Taylor of Classic Octane, so a familiar face for you guys. And uh, you, sir, have done 
many, many, uh, mainly Honda, like CB500 fours, CB550s and such. So you're a, a classic octane, classic Honda kind of guy, and you've uh, <laughs> sold a lot of bikes. So kind of give us all an intro of who you are and what you do, and then we'll uh, kind of dive right into it. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so yeah, I'm Taylor from Classic Octane, like uh, BJ was saying. I've built, I think it's probably 25 or so bikes now. Vast mm -hmm. majority of them have been Classic Hondas, like you said, but pretty much anything pre like 1978 is like what I go to. That's my, my jam is all the, the older stuff, kind of pre-emissions, pre kind of funky 80s styling. Some of those 80s bikes you can make look cool. Some of them are you know, a little bit more of a challenge to make look cool than, than my skill set will allow. But BMW K series bikes are are of that challenge for sure. <laughs> there's no yeah, straight, yeah. there's no good line on them things. <laughs> so that's what that's what I love, and that's what I've always built. Um, carbureted bikes. I don't think I've ever built a, a fuel injected one, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, anything anything classic motorcycles mostly, but occasionally I'll get into some cars and stuff as well. Yeah, actually, so that's that's like another interesting topic is just cars in general. So you and I. Uh, parallel in that sense among some other people but yeah doing cars as well your Camaro is freaking rad that orange is everything <laughs> LS powered it's got a, it's it's got the works so and then yeah, now, I guess that's your, your mom's old, uh, your mom's old hot rod isn't it like you said it was your mom's yes right yeah the uh, 31 model a roadster that's rad <laughs> so yeah. yeah we could go on and on about cars but today we are here to talk about <laughs> finding deals on these old bikes so obviously as you said you do a lot of old vintage stuff so i have three questions for you and uh the first one is what do you feel the best is the best deal you have done and it doesn't have to be like a monetary figure it's it's like just whatever stands out to you if you negotiate it down in a special way or something just uh whatever you feel the best deal you've ever done is the second part of that question is, what did you do to make that deal happen? How did you work it? How did you, how did you negotiate it? That kind of thing. And then the third question is actually going to be just what advice would you have for everybody else who's looking to find good deals on on bikes or whatever? So Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. So let me think through. I think I might give you two examples. Um, it. so the, the one that pops off, uh, immediately in my brain is my, uh, R100 GS, uh, Perry Dakar. Bike. Oh yeah. So if you're not, yeah. For those of, of you watching that are not familiar, um, Perry Dakar BMWs are like super rare, very sought after. They started with like the R, what was it the R80 or R85 GS and the I think 80s the R80 and they, GS, yeah. 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 And they just, they didn't make a ton of them. So mine was a... It was either a 91 or a 93. I can't remember now. Um, but they made, they brought in like less than 250 into the States in that year. So they're super, super rare. Um, and I found that bike because I always go through Craigslist and Facebook marketplace. And I had gone for weeks and weeks and weeks without really finding anything interesting. And I decided to try a different platform. So I downloaded the offer up app, which oh, I had okay. never used before. I had only barely heard of it. Um, so I was like, I don't know, I'll see what's on there. Popped up, went to motorcycles, just started scrolling. And like the fifth one on the list, it just says BMW motorcycle. That's it. There's no awesome. description. There's no model. There's nothing. And I see the picture is, uh, you know, Perry Dakar. And I'm like, uh, wait a second. What? So I click <laughs> on that and read through the bike's been sitting for a number of years, but looks totally complete, clean title, everything. The guy's only asking 3,500 bucks for it. And I don't know much about those bikes other than they're rare and they're definitely worth more than 3,500 bucks. So I jump on, bring a trailer just to kind of double check that I'm not going crazy. And I see that these bikes are selling for like 11, 12, 13 grand mm -hmm. uh, when they come up. Only like maybe two or three of them sell a year on there. So yeah, not bring a trailer, sales. like I would say bring a trailer prices are at their peak like that. You're looking at. Oh, yeah peak possibly inflated prices but you still have to use that as part of your research so yeah right exactly i had no comparables to kind of go off of what the value would be because i'd never seen another one pop up for sale so that's what i went to um, just to kind of verify that i wasn't crazy i reached out to the guy and what turned out to be the case is the owner of the bike was the owner of this like construction company and he just had one of his employees listed for sale and the employee didn't want to list it on his personal Facebook page. So he just picked another platform, 
didn't know anything about the bike and just said, I don't know, it's a BMW motorcycle, bam, 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 listed it. And I just like happened to catch it at the perfect time oh Gosh, <laughs> to be able to go out there. And, and the bike was legit and everything checked out. And I was like, I'm paying you $3,500 cash right now. I'm not going to negotiate. I'm not going to do anything because it's, you know, I already feel like it's a crazy deal. Uh, surely, so that bike, surely his yeah. boss would have given him a, a price to list it at. I guess he probably told him 3,500, but yeah, it wasn't marketed at all. Right. Exactly. And I met with the guy that was the owner too. So I, I you know, I didn't feel like this guy was like, you know, the boss was going to be like, I asked you to sell for 13, five and you, you know, you forgot the one or something. Oh man. Um, so I did talk to the owner and he was just like a, an older guy that was retiring and I don't think he really cared to like do any research or anything. He was just trying to clear out his buildings to like sell the company or whatever. And I just like caught it at the perfect time where he was just ready to get rid of them. Whoa. Um, so yeah, I ended up putting, I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred dollars in parts just to get that thing back on the road. And, you know, I, I'll fully disclose, I sold it for like 12 grand, like three months later. <laughs> Dude. So, hell yeah. Yeah, it was it was a bike that you had to put like um you pull a head off of it you had like low compression or something like that on one side. That's right. Yeah, so ended up having a broken ring um, on on the right side, which didn't score the cylinders. Didn't have anything crazy happen. Very luckily, Um, and those old air cooled um, airhead BMWs are like tractors. Like they're they're so (laughs) incredibly simple to work on. It's crazy that you could pull the head off of one of those things in, in ten minutes. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a huge amount of work. I did have the speedometer rebuilt, uh, by a local place just cause that's a bit above my pay grade. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, other than that, I put some fresh tires on it and cleaned it up, rode it for a while. I had planned on keeping it just because it is one of those like Holy grail bikes, but you know, the mortgage has to be paid somehow. So yeah. And like, like that was the first one to go. You were into, you were into that, right. And I, I would have sold it too. I think you, I mean, I don't know if you still have. Uh, your KLR? No, you probably sold your KLR, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a um an F800 GS. Yeah, so you have you have your adventure bike already, so it's not yeah. like there would be a hole in the fleet as far as like riding style and stuff. Exactly, and like anytime I'm looking at whether or not I'm going to keep a bike, I try to I try to only keep one in each category, and I already had like a modern adventure bike, so I'm like if I want to go blast around off road and do some touring, I'm going to pick that because it's modern. I can just turn the key, ride it all day, like heated grips, you know, it's like a Cadillac. So I'm not going to ride the like rare valuable bike. I'm going to, you know, ride this one that I got to beat up on. Yeah. You're and then if I want to like cars and coffee, you know? Yeah, exactly. And if I want an old adventure bike, I'll ride that one. Mm-hmm. KZ that I built uh, to go scramble around and take down single track and just do a bunch of stuff. You're not supposed to do on a, a 400 pound vintage motorcycle. So like, I, I love I'm that like, bike I by the way. I couldn't I couldn't find a scenario where I'm like this is the bike I would pick to ride other than a cars and coffee and for that kind of money I, I'm up to the point in my uh, in my life where I can just have that that valuable of a bike that I ride you know a handful of times a year so yeah yeah it's easy to get carried away um man that's super interesting though that you like you were just kind of striking out on marketplace or the the usual sources whether that be eBay or if you still use Craigslist or not, but uh, yeah, I've never been on offer up. So I wonder how often that happens where stuff like right. that pops up. Yeah. I mean, I've looked since and have never found anything. So I may have, I've may have gotten the only good deal uh, one and on done, man. I've ever seen. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, it's worth anybody out there. Like it's just like Facebook marketplace or whatever. You can go through and select vehicles, motorcycles, you know, whatever category you want. And, you know, check it out. I think people use that maybe a little bit more than Craigslist. I don't think I've been on Craigslist, truth be told, in well, a like, long, long time. Throughout this video, I've kind of talked about Craigslist and, and and stuff like that. And there's there was an era where all of us probably did use it. But yeah, ever, ever like as of late, it's pretty much considered considered dead. But I do make a point to go on there occasionally to look for who is, you know, who hasn't got the memo. Like somebody's still posting mm-hmm. up. And I guess that's kind of the not really the case that you found that uh, found that thing on offer up, but um, that does bring up, like I had mentioned earlier, a, uh, a certain sales sales tactic of mine is just type in old motorcycle because Mm -hmm. you will find those things that aren't listed under like a certain make or model or whatever. And they don't know what they hundred percent. 
you know? Yeah, that that was going to be my exact answer for like what one of my kind of tips and tricks would be mm -hmm. is have the widest filter that you can stand. You know, like obviously yeah. you're not going to scroll through everything listed on Facebook Marketplace and you're going to get a bunch of, you know, baby clothes and this and that. But like if you limit it to motorcycle, if you're me, you limit it to motorcycle maximum year 1978 and then okay. just spend the time scrolling through. I would say pretty much every bike I would consider like a good deal. That's how I found it. It's pretty much like the most wide net possible. And you find those people that, you know, maybe it was their husband's bike and their, you know, whatever, maybe their husband passed, maybe whatever, like maybe they inherited the bike and they don't know anything about it. Yeah. Those are going to be the best deals you find is the people that don't really know what they have. They don't really care to do the research. They just want this thing out of their garage. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of the times I've bought plenty of like CB 550s that are exactly listed as old Honda or Honda motorcycle or, you know, Hunda or like just something totally no, the, spelled the typos wrong. are definite. Like there are <laughs> definitely typos out there, you know? Right. So the, the wider net you can throw, the, the more likely you are to catch one of those things like, like out in the fray that is uh, you know, most likely going to be the best deal because if it's a perfect ad for 1976 CB 550 restored, fresh carburetors, key in 70, like that bike is not going to be a good deal because that person knows exactly what they have and they know what it's worth. 100%. and they're probably yeah. over invested in it and trying to get all their money back out of it. And, and, you know, for like, let's say you and I, we aren't exactly, not every bike, at least we're not buying bikes for ourselves. We're buying bikes to then build or flip or whatever. So, you know, you have yeah, to, that's what I tell my wife, kind of the cheap, the, the cheapest thing you can, and you have to, you know, you got to buy it right. You know, you got to be able to make money on the right. back end. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think the search criteria is a little bit different if it's a bike for myself versus a bike that I'm buying for a customer. And it just depends on if I'm trying to meet a customer's budget, you know, obviously that's a constraint. Yeah. And also a lot of the times if I build a customer bike, I'm going to go through the entire bike. So yeah. I'm kind of willing to buy a bike that might start off in a bit more rough condition because I'm going to rebuild the engine. I'm going to replace bearings. I'm going to, you know, like I'm already planning on stripping that thing down to the bare frame anyway. Yeah. The labor so, is the same. Most. Exactly. Right. And it's peace of mind. If you're building a bike for a customer, you just know everything's, you know, gone through assuming your customer has the budget to do that. And that's something you've got to kind of work through um, on an individual basis. But like, if I'm looking for a customer bike, I typically will go that route. If I'm looking for something for myself, typically it's going to be something that's kind of rare or one off. And I might have to be, you know, I might have to buy something that's a little bit nicer because it might be the only one that pops up for sale. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah, that R100 GS. <laughs> you did good on that thing. That that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the yeah. videos on it too. I mean, it, that's just such a cool bike. I actually have a customer in Dallas who has one of those too. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I only know one other guy, um, my buddy, Alan, you know, Alan from revival cycles, he has one that they're actually, I think they're going to do a giveaway or something on it at some point this year. Um, so maybe that'll be my chance to, to get another one <laughs> if, I, if I win that one. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. He, um, the, um, was it your mill that you got from him or was it your lathe? Uh, lathe. Okay. Yeah. So that was, yeah, that was something that, I mean, it also kind of goes in that the same kind of vein or of being kind of just on top of stuff. Like if you want to get a really good deal on a motorcycle, you have to be on top of looking at listings because you yeah. have to try and catch that thing before anyone else does. Um, and the lathe was a, a very similar thing of, I just happened to catch him posting that on Instagram, like 30 seconds after he posted it and was able to get a hold of him be like, Hey, I have a trailer. I'm in town give me the address and I'll be there in, in an hour. Oh yeah. And like, in his just try to make it just get back to you, you know? Exactly. And that's the exact same thing I do when I try and buy a bike is that first message I send somebody try to be clear and try to be like, as like upfront as possible. And what I mean by that is like, Hey, I, you know, I love your, we'll use a CB 550. Uh, I'm interested in it. I have cash. What's a good time to meet? Like just be super straightforward of, I'm a legitimate person. I'm exactly. not just sending, is this available? Because nobody's going to respond to that anymore. I'm close by, I have cash, and I'm, you know, I'm a legit person that's going to make this transaction easy for you. 
I'm, I always try to do that on the first message I send anybody on a listing because I know, and you I'm sure know, anytime you try to sell anything, you get a huge amount of messages of people who have absolutely no intention on buying your motorcycle. You know, you'll get a whole bunch of, is this available? You'll get a whole bunch of like, oh, I, I like it. And then no, that's it. They don't respond anymore or whatever. Does it, so does it run? Try. And there's no engine in it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. There's no engine. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, anytime I buy something, I try to differentiate uh, myself from that. Yeah. I, you have to stand out a little bit. I'm the exact same way. Like, uh, by the time I go to, by the time I've reached the point of sending a message to somebody, the initial one, I've already decided that that bike is worth my time going to look at, and I'm going to pursue it, you know, whether it's based on price, rarity, whatever. Um, my first message, bleh, my first message is usually, Hey, I'm located nearby. I have cash in hand. I, when can I come meet, when can I meet, you know, it's mm -hmm. very simple, as clear as, you, you know, just like what you said. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Make it like, okay, dealing with this person is going to be an easy transaction. It's not somebody who's like immediately asking a thousand questions that you can get the answers to those questions. Once you're there, once you're standing at the bike, you can answer those questions for yourself of what's it missing. Here's that, you know, talk, talk to the person, learn where mm -hmm. the project is, why did they stop doing it? Um, you learn all that stuff once you're already there, because somebody's much more likely to deal with you if they've already invited you to like come to their house. You're standing yeah, in front yeah. of them. They know you're serious. Um, also, I, I try not to negotiate too much ahead of time, too. Yeah. I've had a lot of people that like I'll list a bike for sale for whatever, four grand. And somebody's like, cool, will you take twenty five hundred bucks. I'm like, no. But like if you come to my house and you offer me 25 and I sell do 35 and whatever, we can go back and forth and do the negotiation. I'm much more likely to do it then. Cause I know you're here and you're serious, not just randomly throwing numbers out, uh, you know, over a Facebook message. Yeah. A hundred percent, you know, and yeah, I, I definitely feel that. Um, I guess here's a, here's another interesting one. So have you, uh, have you walked away from any deals? I don't think I have which is probably not smart. <laughs> to be honest with I don't you. know. I I'm, I'm the kind of guy that gets like really excited about the new shiny thing. Even if that, you know, especially if that thing is not actually shiny and it's, it's full of rust. It could Just be because shiny I get though. There, right. I can Before I steal wool and some, <laughs> some uh, oven cleaner, I've been going to town on some projects lately. Right. Exactly. So I'm pretty bad about that. Um, I wouldn't give that advice to other people. I would say like have the self control to go in there and be like, if the deal's not right or you're not comfortable with it, like walk away. You know, if you're willing to walk away, a lot of the times they'll be like, hold on. Okay. Maybe I will accept that, you know, lower offer or whatever. It's just like buying a car at a car dealership or whatever. Like if you're willing to walk out the door, all of a sudden the offer does almost always get a little bit sweeter. Um, but I'm, I'm truthfully pretty bad about that. And I, I don't think I've ever not bought one by the time I got to, got to the place oh well, yeah i think that's fair i've i've struck out on a few um you know and mainly it mainly came down to just the information was bad it wasn't what they said or you know mm -hmm. titles signed in the wrong spot oh yeah you know, you know the, i've i've had some bad luck on like hey you know i've asked like okay clear title right well that's not necessarily the full picture mm -hmm. anymore you know, because people will yep. have signed at the wrong spot and uh, or they'll have dated it like three years back. And it's just it complicates things. So a hundred percent. And that's something me. that like, yeah, the more deals you do, um, like now, you know what to look out for because you've been burned a couple of times. Exactly. I've been burned a couple of times. I got a buddy of mine. I just went over to his house yesterday and he has um, more bikes than I do. And he was telling me some stories about like, yeah, I got there and everything was good to go. And then I gave them the money and then we hand over and the title is, you know, salvage title and somebody else's name. And they said like, Oh no, it's a clean title. I have it right here. And like, well, that's not what this means. Like now this bike is, you know, not necessarily worthless, but it's a whole different conversation. If it's, it's not worthless, you know, it's worth less. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's a perfect way to put it. Cause like a lot of those bikes, it depends on what you're going to do with it. Cause if you're going to have a bike for yourself here in Texas, we can do like bonded titles. I'm sure it's pretty similar everywhere. Like there is a process as long as the bike's not stolen to go through and get a registration for the bike where you can ride it 
after a couple of years, you can transfer that over to a clean title and, um, or at least maybe a rebuilt title, some kind of title that's transferable, but yeah. that has to be a bike that you're going to hold on to for a while. If right. You're it's buy much a bike harder. To flip it, yeah. Much harder to do that on a bike that, uh, that you are going to flip, you know, cause it, you know, like, let's say we could have an entire episode on titles, you know, like for real. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it does add cost. And in, in short, it does add cost to go and get a bonded title or a abandoned title, declaratory ownership, whatever. Or if you go through a title service, you know, but yeah, that could be an entire episode right there. So, right. Yeah. So that's an important thing for, for people to keep in mind, you know, if they're buying a project or whatever too, of like the bike isn't everything, you know, the paperwork and all that stuff has to be in an equally good condition for, uh, for the bike to be worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be taped together, you know? <laughs> Yeah, any more, any more. Um, I, I asked to see the title before I hand cash over, just as like a, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, a hundred percent. Um, so the second example I had, um, that was the best deal I think I've gotten oh. besides the BMW is my KZ 750. Mm -hmm. So that I actually found it in a state sale. So that was something that like my wife loves going to estate sales. She's into vintage furniture and we buy all kinds of old lamps and stuff and I fix them up for her. And so we're always looking through um, estate sales and she saw one that just had like a motorcycle in the back of the garage. And I was like, well, clearly I'm interested in going with you now. So we go there. It's like Sunday afternoon, 50% off day. Mm -hmm. I always walk into the house and I go straight to the garage Yeah, because <laughs> I'm looking for, I'm looking for tools. I'm looking for anything I care about. You know, I don't want to buy old Tupperware or whatever's inside the house. So I see the bike and it has a price tag of eight hundred dollars on it. I'm like, okay, it, it looks like it hasn't, you know, moved in a long time. I talked to the people there. They're like, yeah, the owner said it hasn't moved since uh, like the early nineties. I'm like, okay, so it's been sitting a while. I'm looking over the condition and everything, and and they're like, oh, and today, by the way, everything's fifty percent off. And I'm like, so the bike is fifty percent off too? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okie dokie, sold. Like. No, like no hesitation right it's there. My arm. And the funny, yeah. The funny thing is, there was a lady standing next to it the whole time I was there. I just assumed that she worked there. Turns out she was waiting for her husband to come to look at the bike because she wanted it. And I just like swooped in, looked at it for like ninety seconds, and was like, "Cool, I'll take it." Oh. And that lady ended up storming out, like slamming the door to the house, like she was so mad. But that's a prime example of like. If you find a good deal, do not hesitate because somebody like me or somebody like BJ is going to swoop in and they're going to be like, boom, this is a good deal. I know it's a good deal. I'm in. And they're going to beat you to it. So like you have to be ready to like move on something quick if it's a good enough deal. Otherwise, like there are a bunch of other people out there looking for the same kind of deal. That, that's exactly what uh, I've been saying for like, you know, I get comments saying like, those deals don't exist around me. And I, you know, I'm, I'm firm in my stance here. Like, yes, they do. You just have to beat people like me and you from getting mm -hmm. there first. You know, it, it is a competition and uh, I'm going to be persistent. And like I said, I got cash in hand and gas in the van. So like, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I literally keep like a little envelope of at least like a little bit of cash so that I don't even have to stop at an ATM. I don't have to stop. You know, if it's a Sunday afternoon, the bank's closed, whatever. Exactly. Like, you got to be ready to, like, jump on that that deal as soon as it pops up. And there's been times, like, I've, I've driven, you know, two hours away at 8 o'clock at night when I just bought my uh, my trials bike. It popped up for, like, I want to say it was, like, $300 or something like that for a full trials bike that's probably, I don't know, it's maybe worth, like, 15 1800 bucks. It's not, like, a crazy, crazy um you know, deal, but it was like popped up to where I was like, are you available now? Like, I'll come right now. And I like drove an hour outside of Austin at, you know, 830 on a Sunday night. And my wife's like, okay, I'll come with you, I guess. <laughs> <And, like, laughs> Drug her out there and, and you know, bought it. And that's just kind of, you have to be willing to do that to get, you know, the really good deals. You got to be able to jump on them. I really want a trials bike. It's some, I, I just, at some point I'll have one, but oh man, th th those look like so <laughs> much fun. You know? Oh Yeah riding my big F800 GS off-road and just wrestling 450, 500 pounds was like exhausting. So I'm like, what's the opposite of this? Okay. A bike that weighs like 125 pounds and I could just go <laughs> blast it around. So um, I just got it running um, recently, right before I took my little, my little break here. So 
Um, I haven't even really been able to enjoy it yet, but as soon as the weather warms up a little bit, I'm going to be out there. Now, let's be honest here. You're, you live in Austin, Texas. There ain't no cold weather. You, it gets down to the fifties, right? Maybe 40. It's going to be six. It's going to be 63 today. So uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to hear <laughs> No, we're having a good week weather-wise. I mean, it's all it's rain, but it's like in the 40s, so I mean, that's not bad. So, sure. Well, I that's some good info. Like uh, a lot of good stuff said and and uh I appreciate you, you know, giving your time to do this. It was really cool. So, um one final question. How many bikes do you think you've owned? Hmm. I would say total probably 40. 45 something like that if i had to guess okay. i think currently i I've, I've slimmed the um the collection down a little bit i think i'm probably at like maybe 16 or 17 right now um you know the vast majority of those are, are yet to be to be fixed so i'm probably at like five or six completed bikes um yeah, but probably i would say somewhere between 40 and 50 total one fifth of the fleet runs that kind of thing <laughs> yeah i mean that's a pretty good ratio for me yeah <laughs> so well, awesome. I do appreciate it. Um, I, I keep saying I'm, I'm excited to get this episode up. It's going to be a long one. We're probably pushing two hours here with everybody. So, wow. yeah, but yeah, you know, we're, we're ending a- it off with you. Um, I definitely will have everybody's information down in the description. So, uh, again, please go check that out. Subscribe to everybody. Check everybody out. We all have cool, interesting, unique content and uh, you guys should enjoy it. So. Anyway, I'm going to get back to doing what I'm doing and uh, what's what's on your schedule for today. Uh, today I'll be doing a, a bunch of running around. I have a set of carburetors to rebuild for a customer. And so just tinkering in the garage as much as I can. There you go. Well, I'll let you get back to it. But again, I yeah, do thanks, appreciate man. it. So Yeah, it was fun. Let's do it again. Will do. Again, we'll have to have another episode just talking about titles. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. All right. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Yep. See ya. Oh, uh, yeah. Was it like, a factory color? Yeah, it's factory yeah. color. Okay. Very similar to the Maverick. Yeah, those Not Sonic Blue. Okay. But, yeah, it was a good color. So, and the constant battle to have the perfect daily. I, I'm i very happy with that thing. The, the Maverick? Yeah. I can see. Well, I'm, you and your I'm very, steering wheel. Heated steering wheel. <laughs> yeah. You guys want to see more on the Maverick? You got to go to the Tangents channel. So, good stuff. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about this potential format as um, something going forward as maybe a legit podcast. I, you know, um, me and Thomas, who you guys have seen from on here, we have been kind of talking about doing some sort of podcast. You know, I want to see what you guys' thoughts are. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to maybe put it just continuously on YouTube or something. We have to figure out the format, but you know, it's always fun just talking with people and that's part of it, you know, like there's a lot of people out there that all have cool stories and there's been a lot of podcasts and I've been on a few and I listen to a lot, but uh, you know, there's, I think there's room for everybody. So um, again, I know this is a, a very different format from what I usually do. But it's also addressing a question I get constantly. So uh, why not? This is a spontaneous idea. So put your comments down below. I want to hear the deals that you guys have got. I think I think this would be like a really cool uh, sort storyboard of, of different you know different scores and purchases and things like that. So anyway, hope you guys like this one, and uh, hope to see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.